Kevin, I know you did a great job uh, kind of walking us through the reason why you you think CCJ is kind of topped out. Uranium is kind of overheated at the moment. We looked at deviation from the uh, moving average, et cetera. Are there any other sell side indicators that you guys use, uh, Kevin or, or, or Patrick, to determine uh, when to sell or exit? Yeah, well, <clears throat> it depends on your time frame, doesn't it? It depends whether you're a long-term investor, whether you're swing trading, you know, your particular um, points from a technical charting perspective for entries and exits will, you know, center around a particular number of indicators and support and resistance lines. One that we use um, a lot and has proven to be, well, um, incredibly effective, actually. I was going to say surprisingly effective, but uh, I probably shouldn't be surprised, is the distance from moving average. Hey guys, Capital Cosm here. Before we start this video, I just want to let you know that I believe that we are on the cusp of a major uranium bull market. Now, these things don't happen every other week. The last uranium bull market peaked in 2007, the one before that, in 1978. So when these things happen, you've got to take advantage of it. And how explosive are they? Well, you've all heard the stories, uranium skyrocketing from $10 to $20, all the way up to $150 in these uranium bull markets. Where will it go this time around? Well, we don't know. We'll see. But you've got to take advantage of the opportunity. What better way to do that than to leverage Justin Hune's Uranium Insider newsletter? You get access to his monthly newsletters, his webinars, his stock picks, his portfolio, all of that stuff. You get access to guests that you may not see on YouTube. You get access to having them ask questions that you may not see anywhere else. So I highly recommend if you're gonna take part in this uranium bull market, you check out Uranium Insider. Link is down in the description box below. Be sure to click the link. There's quarterly plans, there's annual plans. So if you're kind of tepid, you're kind of hesitant, you could always go with the quarterly plan, kind of test things out, sample things out, see if you like it or not. But the way I see it, guys, you know, you've got to pick the right stocks. A lot of these uranium companies are not going to make it to the other side. Now, and, and Justin Hune's uranium portfolio has outperformed the likes of URA by a significant margin. Since 2019, it's up 5x from where it started. So click the link down below and we'll get started right now on the video. Thanks, guys. Hello, guys. Welcome to Capital Cosm. Do not adjust your TV set, your phones, your monitor, etc. You are not seeing... I guess quadruple would be no would be I don't know what, what you would call it you know five pen pentuples something to that effect but we have an all star cast lined up for you today a huge panel we've got Andy from Finding Value Finance Casper from Uslink Patrick from North Star Bad Charts and Kevin as well from North Star Bad Charts gents thank you guys for coming on it's great to be on thanks for uh, thanks for inviting us and getting us all together. Yeah, as always, yeah, nothing you. on this show is to be taken as financial advice. No mm -hmm. one on this broadcast is a financial advisor. So please do your own due diligence. With that said, gentlemen, let's go ahead and kick it right off with what the people want to hear. Uranium. Your forecast, your outlook for the current diagnosis of the uranium market. We spiked all the way up to $106 over the course of the last several weeks. We've kind of stagnated this past week. The miners have also stagnated. We're going to go around and uh, kind of get your overall very generalized take on uranium. Let's go ahead and start with Kevin. We've, I know uh, Uslink, Andy, and Patrick, I've had you guys on the, po on the podcast recently. So let's uh, start off with a fresh take from Kevin here. What's your current take on the uranium market? Has it run too fast? Is it correcting? Uh, what do you think? And feel free to share any charts, FYI. Yeah, just uh, trying to figure out the, uh, the screen sharing at the moment whilst you're talking there. But uh, to answer your question, the, um, the, the the whole bull market for uranium has been pretty interesting so far. It really took off with the miners outperforming the metal to a very large degree. And that un outperformance has been handed back again. So we're pretty much back to where we started. So the miners and the metal have now performed roughly equally. I've got a chart to show you on that. So I'll, uh, I'll see if I can get this screen sharing working. I'll just... Uh, you hit a couple of buttons there, and uh, you're probably looking at my Bitcoin chart there at the moment. So I will change that, and we'll uh, skip to uranium. Uh, so a couple of uranium charts. Uh, the uranium spot price, I think anyone that follows me is probably fairly familiar with this 
<clears throat> this arc based uh, pattern that we've been following uh, for quite a long period of time now. And uh, this was first identified by, by myself back in 2019, 2020 as a possible roadmap taking us back to uh, values above $100 for the uranium spot price. And uh, it's taken its time and we've had a couple of uh, consolidations and corrections along the way, but the ARC target has been hit pretty much uh, as I would have expected. We briefly hit it back in uh, 2022, uh, a couple of years ago, and then pulled back and then we've really taken off again. There's a little bit of a gap on the left-hand side, you'll notice, where the, uh, the price kind of vacuumed to the downside. Now, I'm not entirely uh, a fan of gap analysis. It, uh, gaps often aren't filled for many, many years. You don't necessarily have to go back and fill gaps, but I suppose um, on the way back up in this kind of situation, it just adds a little bit, I suppose, to the weight of evidence that this thing could continue to vacuum to the upside towards the 130 or even 140 mark. So there, there may be a little bit of juice left in the, in this move yet. But um, these arcs, by the way, they don't always have to have a, a sort of a cup and handle pattern look to them. So that's the cup pattern. Sometimes you get a handle forming on the right hand side here, but not always. The Bitcoin chart was one that showed uh, and, and many other cryptos as well during the last bull market where these arc patterns formed and the price just went up and up and up. The Ethereum chart broke out of its arc somewhere. I think it might have been near a thousand dollars or thereabouts and of course shot up much, much higher. Uh, multiples higher so you don't you don't need to what i'm trying to say is we don't necessarily have to have a a pullback of significance at this point uh, moving on to um the chart for the miners versus the metal and in fact we've got the um we've got the miners the ura index i think i'll go to that chart next the ura etf and i use this one because it uh, has quite a lot of uh, time history on it and it allows us to do some good technical chart analysis and for people who are watching this, perhaps not too familiar with some of the squiggles that are on this chart, we've got the 12-month moving average. That's the red line and the three-year moving average. When you're in a bull market, you want to be above uh, those moving averages. You also want to be above something called the Ichimoku cloud, which is this weird sort of red and green cloud type of uh, uh, squiggle on the chart here. It acts as support and resistance in bull markets and bear markets. It adds to the weight of evidence, and we broke out very clearly above the moving averages and through that cloud we hit a horizontal resistance zone. And for a period of a couple of years or more, it was actually best to just uh, step aside and wait for the market to uh, break out in its uh, continuation breakout. Very typical bull market action, this. You've got the breakout, you've got the consolidation and the pullback to resist to, to support levels, and then a renewed breakout. So on the assumption that the arc continues to hold and the resistance zone is uh, surpassed and price punches through the resistance zone, I think the uh, the next natural target is probably going to be somewhere around the $50 mark. It could be a little bit higher towards 65 There's a zone uh, higher up here where we could well be headed for over the next um, 12 months or so. So that's my roadmap target for, for where we're likely to be going in the time scale. But of course, what we we're talking about a moment ago is how the um, miners are performing versus the metal. And this is where the bull market took off back in uh, 2019, 2020. And you can see huge outperformance where the chart uh, moves strongly to the upside, showing that the miners are outperforming the metal. When the chart's going up, the miners are outperforming. When the chart's moving to the downside, the metal is outperforming. So we outperformed by well over 100% on the miners when the bull market took off. The miners shot out of the starting gates, hit a natural resistance level, and then they've given it all back. Um, to start forming a potential arc pattern. And it's not until you get some touch points on the right-hand side that you can actually fix these arcs in position. And then when that happens, it's really useful at that point because you, it gives you that target time and the target price starts to become a little bit more fixed. So it's early, early days yet, and we just don't know quite how wide or how deep this potential arc is going to get. But we are likely to be now much closer to the end of this move than the the beginning of the move. So I think we're close to the point where the miners are, are going to start outperforming the metal. We don't really get strong evidence until we pass through this green line, the uh, three-year moving average, and this uh, Ichimoku cloud and this horizontal uh, resistance level. So the evidence for a, a uranium miners strong bull market is, is um, I won't say weak, but it's, um, it's, it's less... Um, supported until we get above this evidence cluster. Once we're above that evidence cluster there, then it's much, much more likely that we're heading up to the target area. So 
Um, the miners have done well. They've done equally as well as the metal. But, um, you know, we, we did have a, a big period of outperformance. And you can see that with, with Cameco. And this will be my uh, my last uh, chart to show you on the on the miners. Um, Patrick, I don't think will mind me showing you this. Uh, it's one of our plays that we played um, on uh, uh, with, with our website members. And we entered the uh, trade when Cameco broke out based on a monthly breakout. This is a weekly chart, but on the monthly breakout, we took an entry on the continuation breakout at just above $31. And we um, estimated a target using distance from moving average, an initial target, uh, and a profit limit close to fifty dollars. Uh, and we we exited at that point when that profit limit was hit just very recently, of course. And since then, the price has pulled back as we would have expected. We're in a a rising channel now. If you look at it on the daily chart, it might be a little bit clearer just what's going on. You can see this nice rising channel, uh, the pullback that's taking place. So the next entry for Cameco will be a move above this red line uh, and in particular if it manages to break out above this solid black line at the top here and breaks up and out of the channel uh, something that's really important to look at um, and, a, and a tip for anyone doing technical analysis um, when you're thinking of taking position with any individual miner just do a, a ratio check to compare that miner to the rest of the market so you can take a look at um, the indicators you can put um, the uh, how it's performing versus the URA index. So I've got the ratio versus URA here. And you can see at the bottom of the chart, if I just put this onto the um, onto the monthly chart, hopefully we'll be able to just zoom down a little bit. And let me just see if I can get the ratio chart to show. It's actually not playing ball at the moment. Um, let me just... Hit, 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 hit F5, Kevin. Reset the whole thing. Okay, that's probably a good idea, pal. I'll do that. If that doesn't, doesn't work, reboot your PC three times. <laughs> sacrifice two goats. <laughs> I should say that Patrick's uh, an ex-IT uh, uh, software engineer. So he's, uh, I, was oh, gonna, I was going to say, have you tried turning it off and back on again? Uh, hit, hit, it, hit it with a hammer, switch it off and on again. That's about as far as my IT knowledge goes. So yeah, here's a, here's a tip for anyone um, uh, taking a position in anything, whether it's uranium miners, gold and silver miners, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies, compare it to the rest of the market. So here, this uh, indicator at the bottom is the ratio of this chart to the URA index. And you do not want to be taking a position in anything if, if it's underperforming the ETF that represents the sector. So if it's a gold miner, you want to be outperforming GDX or one of the, one of the gold mining indices, GDXJ or SIL or, or whatever your index of choice is. So take the miner that you're thinking of buying do the ratio versus its index. And if it's outperforming the rest of the index, that gives you a huge amount of added um, evidence that the chart that you're about to buy is one of the handful of charts that you want to be buying. There's a lot of stuff in the URA index that is underperforming the index. Why would you buy that? You want to buy one of the outperformers. So I'll uh, I'll, I'll stop talking there because I know the, the rest of you got stuff you want to say, but um, that's just a, a little tip, a really useful um, um Little, little nugget there I wanted to share with everybody. Yeah, fa fantastic yeah. data there, Kevin. I, I just kind of want to go over some of the key points that you mentioned. Uh, you started things off looking at the uranium metals price, and you kind of alluded to a forecast of around $140 to $150 just based off of that uh, parabola. Um, that brings you to about a 50% increase where we're at today, or a little under 50% increase. Uh, you also looked at the miners uh, as well using that same parabola uh, curve too. Um, and that brings you somewhere around the ballpark of a hundred of a doubling um, you also alluded to by you know, over the next 12 months or so. And then finally, you looked at the miners versus the metal. Now the miners versus the metal that tracks, that kind of tracks a forecast deeper into time. I think, I believe it was like 2027, you know, you would see like a 150% uh, increase between the equities and the metal itself. So between looking at the metal, looking at the miners, uh, looking at the miners versus the metal, you know, how do you kind of consolidate that data in terms of ratios to kind of come up, come up with, because if I were just to look at the miners chart, you know, I would say, okay, that's a hundred percent move. But then I look at the miner versus the metal. I see even more undervaluation and potential more upside because you're, you know, we're number one, you know, that's assuming a, that's assuming a, a constant uranium spot price at whatever it is today, $106, hundred percent move given the concept, but it, it does appear that that uranium price is not going to stay constant. The denominator is going to keep going up, which precipitates an even higher numerator. 
So I'm, I'm really curious to also get everyone else's take uh, here as well. You know, if you can kind of answer this question as we go along is how do you leverage all of these ratios? How do you leverage like all this data to come up with a unified solution? Um, I'll let you quickly answer it, Kevin, then I'll go to, to, to Patrick there uh, after you. Yeah, sure. I mean, of course, with the ratio chart, the ratio chart can go up as both instruments drop. So the ratio may well go up, but it just means that one of them is performing better than the other. It doesn't mean that they're both heading in an upwards di direction. It could just mean that one is losing less than the other. So that ratio chart could mean that the uranium miners are going to lose less value than uranium the metal whilst they both drop in value. So there's no, the ratio chart itself does not tell you anything about the direction that the uh, individual um, parts of that pair are going to move in. It just tells you which is likely to be the stronger performer going forwards based on the technical analysis. Um, of course, and the assumption that we're in a bull market, it's fair to assume um, over a medium to longer time frame that that direction is going to be to the upside, but that can't be taken for granted. So you have to look at each chart on its own in individual merit and build an evidence picture based on the things that I was talking about, like moving averages, the Ichimoku cloud, whatever your indicator of choice is that tracks price, momentum, um, and all of that kind of stuff. So you bring together as many pieces of evidence as you can to build a picture as to what the probabilities are of price going up, down, or sideways. And it, another really important point, you know, I've got a background in um, in forecasting in the world of meteorology, and this this applies across all um, aspects of forecasting, whatever discipline you're talking about, including this one, is that there is never, um, a, a, you know, a, a golden um, solution. Uh, there's no magic solution to knowing whether price is going to go up or down. It's always, always, always a case of what are the probabilities. And if you can identify that the probabilities are um, asymmetrically balanced, in other words, if the probabilities are strongly favoring a move to the upside or a move to the downside, then you can go long or short. But that's only half of the half of the um, equation. The other part of the equation is risk and money management. So you have to bring into that, okay, so I've now got a 70 to 80% chance that the price is going up. Now let's have a look at the risk and, and money management situation. What's the risk reward calculation? And if the risk reward calculation is adequate, if it's say three to one or better, then uh, you know what is, where, where am I going to put my stop loss? What's my nav potentially going to drop by? You hear people talking about a 100% gain. That Cameco chart went up by about 60, 70%. We could be all over social media plastering, oh, 60, 70% gains. We're not. And, and why aren't we? And we've had 100% winners as well. You know, why aren't we sort of plastering that all over the place? Well, because if you're going to be responsible, scientific and professional about it, you have to acknowledge the fact that you're only going to go up 100% if you risk 100% of your capital. If you put, if you've got $100,000 to play with and you put all $100,000 on it, then sure, you've gone up to 200000 and you've made a 100% gain. But that would nobody does that unless they're absolutely crazy. You would take maybe a 1% or 2% NAV risk. So if you take a 2% NAV risk and it was a 3 to 1 risk to reward, your NAV has gone up by 6%. So we've got a 6% gain and that gets locked in, that goes gets carried forward and can be reused in, in future trades. So it doesn't sound as dramatic and you're not going to get as many clicks if you say you've made a 6% NAV gain. But when you hear people talking about 100% this, 200% that, from my kind of sort of scientific come sort of professional background, I, I just... I don't like that. It, you know, it, it irks me a little bit, and it, it 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 raises red flags. Really, it's just kind of clickbait. I suppose we're all guilty at times of a little bit of clickbait, and you know, from time to time, it, it can be funny, it can be interesting. But as long as in the background, you you know, you're making people aware of the fact that actually, you know, there's it's it's not that's not that simple. You know, you, you you've got to be level headed about it. Otherwise, you just get caught up in the same old. Uh, issues and problems that, that people have done for years and you'll end up giving back all of your gains. Anyway, that's enough from me. So I'll, no, I'll let somebody else speak. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's fantastic. Uh, Patrick, <laughs> uh, same question to you. What's your overall fork? I mean, you guys work together, so I'm assuming that you guys have fairly unified. No, 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 it's got totally different views okay. to me. I don't, agree with, okay. I don't agree with a thing Patrick says. He just talks a load of garbage the entire time. Don't listen He's to your it. contrarian indicator, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> So, Patrick, Ying same question to you. What's your uh, outlook on the current uranium market? All right. Uh, well, there is somebody that went all in. It's called Michael Saylor of Bitcoin there. He put everything. He put 100%, right? 
All right. Okay. So I'm sorry, Michael. I don't know you. I shouldn't mention no, your name. There, but there, there goes Michael's the chance of coming on the show. You or if ever, you know what's scary? I never heard about this word. It's called a god candle. And you must have seen this there. I yeah, saw I this uh, Max uh, Kaiser. He, he mentioned a god candle. It's a candle where the price goes up so much, it's statistically impossible for it to go up yet. It, it's sent out like a carrot. So once we start having that type of mentality in uranium, we got to be really careful, really looking at the charts. When people say, uh, "What overnight uranium could go up $100, uh, there's a rupture in supply, I don't know, whatever, insert any fundamental problem, and people are putting in numbers that statistically have never happened or they're once in 30 or 40 years type of events, sure, they could happen. Like Kevin said, it's a possibility. But seriously, what's the probability of that happening? It's, it's an outlier, right? Um, so yeah, Kevin covered it pretty good. I did, I, I found it, I'll share my screen there. I found a chart and I, it's unfortunate because I used to have a, on Quan DL, I used to be able to import the spot price of uranium going back to the eighties and, and do some TA on it. And for some reason that thing broke, but I got this historical chart, uh, right, right. This one here, it's going to, there won't be any TA. I think a quake, uh, John quake shared this on Twitter. So I, I credit for him. So yeah, it stopped at 2016, but we saw Kevin's uh, uranium chart, right? We're what? We're at a hundred bucks now, 106. So we're right about here, right? So here we have the peak in 2007 or eight, 2007. And then we have a doozy of a peak back, I think in 76, I think 75. Oh, we by this by the way, that, that, that chart only goes up to 2016 FYI. Yeah, so like exactly. the inflation adjusted today is going to be even higher than that, but go ahead. Well, yeah, but infl inflation adjusted. Well, okay. Well, just based on let's do, do we do the TA on that chart right now? We're we're overheating, and I'll show you another chart. Like it, it's crazy because price goes up. We're all making money, and people it feeds right. And after that, but once everybody's bought with all these great gains because we're talking about it, we got to be really really careful. Just like chemical showing some signs of weakness that you know was stretched from the moving average. I'll show you here. Here's the U.UN chart. So this one tracks pretty much the um, well, the spot, the the physical price. Mm -hmm. Look at this. We're already back at a 2000 peak on that chart, but look at the distance from moving average. Goodness gracious! How greedy do you guys want to get? How greedy? We're we're in like the low risk entries, guys. Can't lie about it. The low risk entries are here when you're coiled and tight, close to the three year moving average where nobody's talking about it except, uh, you know, a few people. After a pullback, after beautiful, like, uh, what is that? Two-year consolidation, one solid year consolidation. But we're so stretched. We're so, so stretched. If I give you that chart and I don't tell you it's uranium and you don't know nothing about uranium, you're, you went, this is the log scale. Look, I'm going to remove the log scale. That thing's gonna, just going to look bonkers. Jesus, it's like, what are we doing here? So you got to be really careful. There's a whole bunch of measured moves on, on the price here that have been reached. Look at that. You've reached it, overshot it. It's only in hindsight because when you see the price here, you, ah, oh, has to go up, has to go up. But what could happen is, I don't know when, but some the next move here, right? Because I could have done the same thing here. Let's say I do replay. I'll just hide everything. Look look how that look here. You, you think you're, 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 you're God here, but look how stretch it was. Like historically, probabilistic wise this you're, you're starting to, to go in territories and you did the measure moves measure moves after measure moves here's a pull flag targets reached it doesn't mean it can't continue but you got to be it's, there's no low risk entry here guys like i don't know who's i would never tell somebody it's time to buy uranium here the 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 metal it makes no sense it's actually a time to exit it, it is statistically and even if i would exit here and the price did go up it was not wrong to exit here. You cannot blame anybody from exiting here based on what the chart is showing you right now. Even if the price triples from here and goes bonkers, that's a lower probability event than some type of cooling down, a two month consolidation, giving you a better, letting that moving average catch up. So the momentum is up. Nothing's broken on that inclining momentum. But as soon as you have Either you take profits in ultimate strength, which is now, or you wait for something like this here. You wait for the momentum. I'll just remember, you wait for the momentum to break down. And I'll show you. Once the momentum breaks down, doesn't mean the price goes down. 
but it means the moving average, the price is not going up fast enough and it's letting the moving average catch up, which is good. And that's exactly what happened here. You see that the price was just going bonkers on move these arrows, just went bonkers. And then people thought to the moon here, I'm sure the tweets go that date, look at all the tweets and we're, people are calling for God candles here, rupture in the system, uranium, whatever, all the bullish news, they happen here in this candle here. It must've been bonkers, but look, the momentum was breaking down, starting to fall down, even the one after here, break down in momentum. And what happened? Two-year consolidation, super healthy or year and a half consolidation. The question is, do you want to be stuck in a sideways consolidation, hoping it goes up, which it should, it should resolve upwards, but there's always a chance, guys, because once you stop going vertical, there's always a chance that these consolidation patterns, it could have broken downwards, guys. There was the, prob the probabilities augment as you're going sideways in a neutral plane, that there is a probability now the increase that you could have you could have went down right. So you never want to get trapped here. You don't want to do opportunity cost. You want to step aside and you want to get back in right here. Once the momentum's reset, and then it starts breaking out again, then you go bonkers. But unless you have a trading system where you say I'm not selling until it goes below the 30-week moving average, like Stan Weinstein, uh, Stan Weinstein sage analysis. Okay, write it. Just even here, somebody could say, as long as I'm above the one-year moving average, I'm writing it, right? Find your profile, find your time frame, but there is no low-risk entry here. There's no low-risk entry. There's just not. And uh, for targets, well, you, you're in a profit-taking zone now. For the people who entered here, for the people that entered here and here, th this is a, it's the flag move. It's the whole pull move there. It's it's done. You're, you're, you're there. I don't know how to sugarcoat it, but... Um, I would never enter here. I would exit, wait for consolidation. And even if the price goes up, it's not the end of the world, guys. There's other setups. There's other uranium stocks that are right here. Like there's a whole bunch. Maybe you guys are going to name them, but there's stocks that are ready to move, right? But for the metal itself, it's um, it's it's overheating there for sure. Wow. Patrick, you just threw a grenade into this oh. room. I'm un well, I'm un yeah. I'm unbiased and objective. No, it's it's a fair point. It's it's 100 percent a fair point. 100 percent a fair point. But, so but don't I, forget that, that that ties in with that ratio chart that I showed you a moment yeah. ago. In order for the ratio to go up, it would it would be perfect sense for the metal to come down and cool off, and the miners to continue their right. upward move. That would make the ratio do what it looks like the ratio wants to do. Yeah, yeah. The the data the data doesn't lie. The question is, however, is does this pertain to a longer term view or just more of a short term, medium term view of things like in the short, in the longer term, let's say five years out, you know, how does, how does that kind of pertain to the uranium price? Oh, it, long term, it's still bullish because you're above an inclining three year moving average. So long term is three year moving average, medium term, one right. year go. That's like, so as long as you're in, above an inclining three year moving average, it's an up, like just people could say gold have been, has been an uptrend since 2001. If you take, if I take an eight year or 10 year or 12 year moving average, that thing's been an uptrend forever. It's all about people. Like seriously, people have to be honest with their performance returns, what they want. If they're, if they're getting in during a consolidation, but they want actual gains in the next year, they're trapped. But if, if they, they, if, if really truly, truthfully to themselves, they have a five year game plan they're still in the, in the uptrend, right? It's just a consolidation. It's not optimal. You never want to waste two years going sideways. You just don't. Like if I give you an option of going sideways or going forward, where are you going to choose? It's like, oh, I'm just going to stay, stick, stick around. Okay, fine. But you, you know, if you, if you stick around, then there's a chance it goes down or you're wasting, you could be in another asset class, like coal, like there's other stuff also. There's like going bonkers, steel, you know, there's, there's stuff, man, if you look around. So long-term still bullish, but, we're we're in the FOMO zone there. We're entering gotcha. the FOMO zone. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, great analysis there, Patrick. I, I want to take it to Uslink. Uslink, uh, same question to you. What's your kind of prognosis on the uranium sector at the moment? And feel free to respond to either Kevin or Patrick's points there as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, from what Patrick just showed, I mean, I think also the, the metals or the metal itself is getting a bit heated. But again, uh, if we look at some ratio charts, I mean, that's also where, as Kevin mentioned, I think that's when the miners take over. You you have seen the big names run quite heavily, the like, like and Prom. You have the Cameco and the Metal. So I think this will now dribble down into the more medium-sized uh, miners, even the small miners, uh, for this next move up here. 
So I think we can look at, um, I want to show you a similar chart actually. Um, there it is. I'm going to share the screen here very quickly. One second. There you are. Good. Good. Is it, you can see it, right? Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Same thing as Kevin. Uh, Kevin mentioned. You know, this is the URNM uh, compared to the metal instead of URA. So here you have a 100% pure play uh, ETF when you measure it against the metal itself. And actually, the um, the uh, the bounce that we're seeing right now is just perfectly in line with this overall golden uh, formation right here. And also, we came down to some some support here down from where we actually began the previous bull market in, in 2020. Uh, so right now we want to see this, you know, getting above that pivot high right there for me to really see this confirm higher and have miners outperform the metal itself. But from an overall perspective, this pattern here should be somewhat complete and we should, again, should, from a probability point of view, we should grind higher uh, looking at the, the URNM itself against, against the metals. Uh, so I'm I'm completely on board there with Kevin and what he's saying regarding the the URA. We should be very close to the bottom in that ratio, and it makes perfect sense also as as Patrick showed that we are at at the end stages of this move up in in the metal. So again, if the miners can start to to do some gains here, then yes, the ratio should should definitely definitely go up here. Um, also, I want to show you if we measure very simply here. This is the uh, the URA against the SPX. You can also see here that. Ever since you know 2011, this only goes back to 2011 where we have the Fukushima incident. So basically, we have had a what 10 year worth of downtrend, eight years worth of downtrend. Now we have some sideways action, and actually, in my view, one trend line says it all. Really, here, if we can start to outperform, if you already can start to outperform the SPX, that is again a huge indicator that you know uh, that I wouldn't say the big money, but definitely if you were to choose, if we break above you, if you were to choose at that moment in time, which which asset do you want to get into? Clearly, uh, from a ratio perspective, URA is your bet if you had to pick just one. Um, so, so, for, so for me here again, we are very close to having, depending on where you put the line really, but you are very close to having URA starting to come into its uptrend against uh, the SPX, which is actually a huge deal because that means more money will flow instead of going to the SPX, it should flow into URA. And, and basically the same thing again here for, for URA against the NASDAQ. You can see here that also we're coming into a pretty big stiff resistance here. But again, in my view, if we can blast through here, we have touched it so many times uh, coming for the past three years, more or less, that when we get above, in my view, that is when URA, so the miners will outperform the tech sector and again, that is even more valuable to me because tech sector is just uh, really popular at the moment, uh, insanely high valuations. So when and if, because I think this will happen, when we get above that red resistance zone there, URA would outperform the tech, meaning money should flow from tech into, into URA. Again, if you were to place your bet at that moment in time, uranium should be your, uh, your go-to asset class. Um, so yeah, again, again the ratios. Again, I think people don't use ratios enough. I think they measure them, uh, measure like U and M or the minus against the dollar too often. And I know Andy is also very fond of the ratios. And and uh, yeah, ratios should definitely be something that you look at every week, uh, more or less. So if you're interested in uranium, you should have like 10, 5 to ten ratios that you look at, uh, just to see where you are in time. And at some point in time, uh, hopefully when U R A starts to get way too extended. Uh, against the Nasdaq again that should be a time when maybe you should rotate back into the Nasdaq uh, if you have a if you have a great setup there um, also one thing I want to show you which is actually kind of interesting to me again now we have the uranium spot price again something as hard as Bitcoin everyone loves Bitcoin right the, the young age they love Bitcoin but again one trend line says it all really here in my view again we are actually we haven't broken out yet but we are very close to having Uranium spot price outperform Bitcoin here. And again, if we get above here at some point in time, you might be bullish on Bitcoin, but actually at that point in time, if you had to choose, you should be in the Uranium spot price. Um, again, showing to me also, I refer Bitcoin uh, in the same category as tech. So 
So again, a break here of that golden trend line, in my view, just shows the strength that we have seen in in, uh, in the Iranian spot price. Maybe, according to Patrick, we, we cannot break it here uh, in this go. But again, to me, we're just pounding on it you know, more and more often. I think we will have a break here at some point in time. And that is hugely bullish, in my view, for the for the Iranian sector. And uh, and yeah, again, if you had to pick your, if we break and you had to pick one asset to get into, it should be, at least according to this ratio, it should be the Iranian blood price, even though we might stagnate for like for like a year or so, as Patrick uh, as Patrick mentioned, that is definitely the correct asset to be in at that point in time. Again, you have the same thing here, underperformance, you know, bear market, some sideways action, and now we're trying to to kick the door of that huge resistance right there. Um, so yeah, uh, finally but not least, I want to show you some of the smaller miners. Even though we have Cameco, as Sir Patrick uh, mentioned, has done insanely well. I think it's actually up uh, 10x from the bottom of March 2020. But if you look at some of the smaller ones, the the the, the 50 million, 100 million, maybe even 200 million dollar market caps, we can take here very simply mega uranium. Again, here you can see here that actually for the past few weeks we have left we have left a 10 year long range more or less. Uh, and we just broken out here. So again, even though maybe the metal or chemical doesn't look as attracted as we speak, you, you can actually go down the pyramid into the mid and small size junior uh, miners and see that, that there are great opportunities uh, coming, you know, from this uranium bull market. And again, same thing for forces metals. Here we have this beautiful long-term golden trend line broken, breakout, retest, retest, and we have this beautiful triangle here breaking higher. In my view, again, we are going for, you know, a measured move higher here for the forces metals. Um, again, Sky Harbor, quite similar to the the mega uranium chart. Again, we have this long term range here, bit of a double headed inverted head and shoulders, but we have broken out of that gold, long term golden trend line, bullish consolidation, and now we're trying to break higher again here. Uh, so, just going to show you that there is actually many miners that are. In relation to to uh, to USD, but also the metals are just getting started here again. Find a small one here, uh, blasting higher, and again, it's not by any means as I wouldn't say overvalued, but it, it is not as stretched as we might see now on chemical and uh, and uh, some of the other big big tapes. Uh, I think now the place is to for the small mid sized cap to really have its have its turn, and uh, maybe to the big ones to cool off a bit here before we before we eventually eventually go higher. For, for the big names, but that will be some years out, I think. Um, so yeah, that is where I think we are. I think the, from a ratio point of view, we are trying to break out of against uh, the metal itself, also the NASDAQ and the SPX. So again, even though we are very bullish right now, I think there is more to come if we can break these levels and, uh, and then there should be a lot more in the tank for, for uranium um, to come. Yeah, so I guess the upside is that capital has made its way through the large caps and is currently making its way through the smaller caps, as you've alluded to there now. Yeah, uh, which that is my take anyways, yeah. Yeah, and uh, if you look at, let's say, the miners versus the metal, you'll notice that we, despite the huge run in the metal itself, all the way up to $106 from $50 at the start of 2022, I believe, uh, the miners are still priced at pre-2021 levels. So even if the metal does go down, the ratios could also indicate a stagnant miners price that might not retrace the metal's precipitous downward fall. Uh, is, that, is that what you would say as well? Yeah, exactly, exactly. But also, even though it's funny because many people are actually uh, upset that you know that the miners haven't done ha hasn't done uh, very well. But if you look at this chart here from March 2020, we had that big breakout here just last summer. It has actually done. Uh, roughly 50 percent uh, so yeah i know against the metal they have underperformed heavily but hey this is a bullish chart no matter how you look at it from a long-term perspective at least in my view and uh, we are now above the 20 the 2020 21 highs and breaking out maybe doing some retest here but definitely again um i'm uh I i'm very confident that the miners will regain its lost uh, uh potential against the metal and uh yeah so definitely yeah, and I, I think I pointed this out in our podcast earlier a couple of weeks ago, Use Link. But when you're looking at things like URNM versus the SP, URNM versus the NASDAQ, in much the same way that we want to see some of the junior metals begin to outperform the majors as an indication of 
a, a strong bull market. Doesn't the fact that the uranium miners outperforming the broad market and even the more speculative NASDAQ market imply uh, holistically that the market is actually fairly healthy, given the fact that capital is making its way down towards this more speculative sector, as we like to call uranium? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I, I don't think that the uranium market is by any means overvalued. Maybe you look at, the, at, as mentioned, you know, the metal and so on. But if you measure it against the big names like or the big sectors, we are insanely undervalued still. If you look back from a, a 10 to 15 year long perspective, insanely undervalued. And we and and as mentioned and, and showed, we're just trying to get it into next year and have that beautiful, you know, stage two outperformance. Um, so yeah, definitely, we're still early when you measure it against the big, big names and big, big uh, sectors that most people are looking at. Uh, to be fair, you know, I don't know many people that um, that are talking about uranium, except for the people on Twitter and uh, and uh, some of the uh, technical guys on Twitter. I mean, it's still a very small sector, very unheard of for, for many people. Um, so until I see my barber or my, my the guy who cuts my hair, you know, starting to talk about uranium, then I might be 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 at the point in time. Okay, we might be a bit of a in a bit of a too much heat at that moment in time. But until then, you know, it's it's still, in my view, very early and we have some great years to come. Fantastic. I, I want to shoot things over. Uh, unless, is there anything else you want to add to Uslink before I shoot things over to Andy? No, that, uh, that's all for me. So, okay. perfect. Great, great. Andy, same question. Uh, current prognosis of the uranium market, have we run too fast? What do you think? Yeah, so I, I look at things maybe from a little bit longer time frame than everyone else, maybe. Um, so I... I entered the positions in 2020 based off the ratios and I've been holding ever since I haven't sold anything. So I'm just continuing to hold. Um, so my time frame might be a little bit longer. Uh, I'm playing this, this big bull market. That's the way that I'm viewing it. The big commodity bull market, uranium is a part of that. So uh, currently, yeah, we've gone up a lot, but um, you know, I, I'm a hybrid investor. I use the fundamentals and I also look at the technicals to basically justify the unbiased opinion that the fundamentals are still intact. So the way that I kind of view this, uh, SWU, which is the SWU went way up before. Uh, that's kind of our leading indicator that's closest to the customer. Then next, U308 was the next one to go. Uh, and then I just don't see anything that will dramatically change my bullish opinion from the supply side uh, for U308. So uh, I'm not going to try to time anything in the short term. I'm just going to ride this thing for the longer term. Uh, I just don't see what's going to destroy it, destroy this momentum that we are generating um, to the upside on the longer, bigger picture view from the supply side, which then makes me ask the question, what price does it take to destroy the demand? And I just don't know what that what that price will necessarily be. I think it's a lot higher than what most people are probably thinking. Um, historically, if you look at the 1970s and the 2007, we've had inventory, uh, copious amounts of inventory in the 1970s. We had inventory in 2007. And what we did is we went through these credit expansion phases where we pushed the price to, you know, in a commodity bull market upwards. And we hit levels that I would say are equivalent to about 400 to $450 a pound from a ratio perspective uh, of, of pricing that we would meet today. Uh, but you have to look at the market conditions that those occurred under. So we occur, those occurred under inventory, you know, high inventory levels in the 70s. Uh, 2007, we had inventory around. It wasn't a scarcity issue or supply side problem. Uh, and I hate to say it, but this time around, I know that's the the words that will kill somebody. <laughs> uh, the supply side looks pretty dang tight. And looking at previous bull markets, if you looked at the uranium pricing in the 70s and the 2007 era, we didn't really experience pullbacks as that uranium price went up. It was basically a straight shot both of those times. And what I'm more afraid of, and, and this is just me being like the hybrid, like I use a lot of fundamentals and then I use the technicals to justify it. Um, 
I'm scared to lose the position. Like I want to stay and keep it on. I want to keep that position on as long as the supply is really tight and I'm going to ride this thing up. Um, so I've been doing that since 2020. Short term, I agree with everyone who's on this panel here. It, it definitely looks overheated. We have stretched quite a bit over the 200 day moving average, over the 50 day moving average. It definitely looks stretched from all technical analysis perspective. But, you know, on the back of my mind, I said, well, 2007, 1970s, it, it didn't really pull back. It was pretty much a straight shot. And in all honesty, if people start to panic on the on the utility side, I I think this price there's I, I don't think there's any chance that price is going to resolve a demand destruction event anywhere where we're at today, like in the hundred dollar range. Um, I think we are multiples away in terms of pricing to the upside of where this could potentially go. So when you look at you know, like Kevin said, the risk reward, uh, where you're looking at, you know, what's your risk? What's your reward? You know, I see the momentum building. I think we can all see that in the charts. Momentum's going to the upside. Um, I, I'm just scared to lose my positions. So I don't want to sell out. I know no one's gone broke taking profits, but I still think that all the fundamental reasons to own uranium on a long term perspective, they're all still there. Um, and then when I look at, you know, and I can look and, and choose some of these charts. I do ratio charts too, just like everyone else has showed. You know, this is uranium to gold and, and you guys can look at the gold chart and that looks like it's ready to rip to the upside, uh, gold as well. And if we're comparing to something where gold's gonna rip to the upside and uranium's already got momentum behind it, uh, I, I just, I don't wanna lose my position. So I stay long, I accumulate on these pullbacks. I know you guys said, you know, the ideal points that you were, basically these falling wedges I bought there, I bought in 2020. And I, I waited through the entire sideways consolidation, which was here. Uh, I just held on, I didn't sell, I didn't do anything. And I've been riding kind of the developers right now. <clears throat> and we as we've been moving on up and we could probably, if we were to com compare to 2007, I mean, we can go up about four times, four and a half times. Um, I can choose another one against the M2 money supply. I think that's a pretty static measurement. And I think it's kind of a good way to inflation adjust things. That's another four times, you know, 4X from where we are today. And you can see that we've got lots of momentum that is generated and it very well could pull back. And then we've got the S&P 500 uh, just as another one. You can see the momentum's changing and we're starting to move upward. Uh, and another four and a half times against the S&P. And remember, the S&P can come down too. I'm not saying that it has to remain where it's at today. So looking looking at history, looking at the data, and I just do kind of the big picture view stuff. Um, I, I'm just super afraid to lose my position. I don't want to sell out of my position. And I know, you know, some people say you don't, you don't go broke taking profits. But um, if I try to time this and I screw it up, and I, and I still think that there's a good tailwind behind this sector. I, I just don't want to mess that up. Um, there's also tax events that are created. Um, my positions are now really big in it. A lot of them are up over 10 times from my original positions in 2020, and I'm just going to ride it. Um, and, and I'm going to hopefully ride to a level where these, and, and hopefully it's an easy ride. Hopefully we don't get these big pullbacks. It's just kind of easily going up uh, on the uranium side. And, you know, the way, another thing I'll, I'll say is, when you look at kind of how this thing flows through the system, capital, uh, SWU went first because it's closest to the customer. Uranium U308 went next. Then it goes to the producers, which we've seen Camco start to go. It's going to go to the developers and then it's going to the juniors. So if we were to look at risk reward, we would look, look to see where the value is in this sector. Um, and you can look around this sector as well. Uh, the commodity to stock ratio just overall is still very cheap. So we're not in overheated territories anywhere in commodities. Oil's cheap against gold. Uh, all the surrounding sectors are, are still cheap. And then I can look and I can probably pick off some of these really small uh, like developers and, and juniors that haven't really moved yet. So I, I think the money and the capital is going to flow closest to the customer through the, the, the physical metals, into the producer, into the developers, and into the explorers, just like you guys have have mentioned here as well. And I, I think there's still really good 
options and and areas in the juniors that haven't really done much uh, if you want to take on that type of risk uh, because they are incredibly risky always you know i'm not going to say that you can mitigate the risk really i mean it's it, they're they're ultra risky there's high chances you'll get diluted uh, so just keep that in mind if you're looking at some of these really small juniors uh, but everything that i can see momentum's going to the upside we very well, it is overstretched. We very well could get a pullback. Um, URNM, the chart that Uslink had up earlier, we are breaking those all-time highs. Uh, we could get a little bit of a pullback to that all-time high, and we could run to the to the upside uh, and continue to run. So I'm not saying that's my that that it will run. I'm just saying it could run, and I'm not going to lose my positions. I'm riding this thing uh, for the entire entirety of the bull market. And I think the entirety of the bull market will probably end. And I, th I think Kevin had a really good chart there where it was ending somewhere like in the late 2020s, 2028, 2029, 2030, somewhere around there. I think that probably is a, a good solid area of where I think the top could potentially be. So um, I, I'm just afraid to trade in and out. I'm afraid to take those big tax hits, uh, which is really going to reduce my purchasing power and other companies when I get hit there. And then I, I just want to ride it. That, that's my strategy right, wrong, or indifferent. Yeah, fantastic. I, I want to highlight the chart, uh, the supply demand gap that you alluded to, Andy, really quick. So this is the historical uh, uranium supply and demand. Basically, you've got uranium production here shaded in blue, and then you've got demand outlined here with this blue line as well, and then your secondary supply in this light blue line. And what you'll notice is that historically, demand has always kind of fallen below or at current supply levels. But then, you know, you look at the 2007 spike where we saw a huge spike up in the uranium price all the way up to $150. Uh, we, were, we were pretty much at parity with supply and demand. Now you fast forward to today, and these are the forecasts that we're looking at today. You know, you've basically got demand here in blue, or sorry, uh, demand here in, 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 in green rather. And then you've got production here in blue. And what you'll notice obviously is the widening gap between the two. Now, granted, uh, you do see a bit of a tightening of the gap leading all the way out until 20, I want to say 2025, 2026. Uh, but then th shortly thereafter for the years ahead, it begins to expand very rapidly. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, uh, uh, North Star, one, one of the North Star guys, uh, whether it be Patrick or Kevin, uh, how do you reconcile? The more comment? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. Comment. Yeah, the one thing that drives prices dramatically is inventory levels. So uh, inventory levels are not really, they're kind of opaque in, in uranium. You don't really know exactly where they're at and people hide this. It's like they guard it. Um, inventory levels is what's going to drive the price. And I, I, I think we are at really, really low, critically low levels that we've never seen in history of inventory. And and the, the, it now it becomes a game of, are the utilities going to panic and win? And, and I know... The, the charts may or may not pick up when that panic will will come. We can maybe see it in capital flows, but I think the capital is flowing right now and that's why we're getting this vertical move. The question then becomes what will what will stop the move to the upside? Um, I, I know in other markets, the inventories are very, uh, they're easily seen. And we, we also can see that there's a wide diverse array of, of producers that can produce around the world of many of these other commodities. This one's really concentrated. And if you go and you look where all the concentration is in terms of uh, Kazakhstan and even <clears throat> up in Canada, they're ba mainly two big producers. And I would say that they are struggling to increase production, like they are struggling hard. So, to lose a position here, in my opinion, I'm going to keep it on. I'm going to keep these positions on. I've got enough of what I think is going to matter to change my life in it. And, and I want to keep it on because I just don't see where the supply is going to come from. So, yeah, I, I think another good point to add, you, you brought up a very good point that the utilities may not necessarily exhibit the same trading patterns as, as you would see in a conventional chart as well. You know, these guys have to buy uranium one way or the other. And there's a, uranium only consists of a small percentage of their total expenses to maintain these nuclear plants. So, you know, how do, I know we looked at the various uranium charts, uh, UX1, you know, uh, indicating the spot price having kind of shot up way, but way above its 
moving average by, I think, uh, Kevin pointed it out hundred percent over a hundred percent over its moving average. The question is, does, does that really apply to, uh, an asset like spot uranium where utilities may not exhibit the same trading patterns that n- investors would in other commodities? So what do you think there, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a square there that needs to be a circle, a square a circle that needs to be squared there because you, that chart that you just showed with you know supply and demand clearly something's got to give at some point and the different you know that widening gap as you go through the 2030s and into the 2040s looking much further ahead you look at that chart and you think well this can only lead to you know incredibly high prices for uh, spot uranium it can only lead to incredible valuations for miners and well, producers are actually managing to pull this stuff out of the ground their profits are surely set to soar but then you think well you know what is there about the future that we don't yet know what could potentially bring an end to the uranium bull market and you know i've, I've heard i'm not an expert on this but i you know I, I i see the news items coming up occasionally about the the move to nuclear fusion now if they crack that nut then suddenly you know, traditional nuclear reactors and the use case for nuclear reactors might might take a big hit, just as it did uh, post Fukushima. I'm I'm just thinking, you know, I'm just trying to put out there that there could be a drastic news event, whether it's another, you know, nuclear reactor meltdown or whether it is the uh, scientific advancements in nuclear fusion. Now, I know these take many many years to to bring to the market, and building a nuclear fusion reactor is going, probably going to take a decade. So it's hard to imagine how. Um, you know, scientific advancements are going to are going to sort of bring an end to, um, you know, that, that uranium bull market. I mean, Andy mentioned that my chart points to a sort of target with the miners to the metal ratio several years into the you know to the late twenty twenties towards twenty thirty. What happens beyond that um, is as yet unknown from a technical charting perspective. Because, like anything else with forecasting, the further ahead you try and look into the future the more variables and the more unknowns there are and chaos theory comes into it all. And it's the reason we can only forecast the weather accurately, you know, three, four, five days ahead. And once you start going 10 days ahead or two weeks ahead, suddenly the accuracy of your forecasting goes out of the window and you might as well flip a coin. (laughs) It's a snowballing of error. (laughs) Being honest as a meteorologist there, you know, there are limits to the science. So, you know, from a technical analysis point of view, there's not much more that I as a technical analyst can add to the, the roadmap to the late 2020s. Beyond that, um, you know, it is anybody's guess as to whether this thing goes crazy parabolic or, or whether something happens to bring the whole thing back under control again. I My gut feeling is that something happens to bring it back under control again and we, you know, we peak in terms of the bull market sometime in the late 2020s, early 2030s, and and then things cool off and attention moves elsewhere and there's the next big thing. So, you know, my my personal view is that there's probably, you know, another five, eight years remaining in, in this um, uranium bull market. Um, that, that's the kind of timeline that, that I'm personally looking at. So a uh, quick follow up question. Do you think that we'll see a similar spike that we saw in 07 and 78? Or do you think that because of the persistent supply demand gap or because of, I don't know, maybe different patterns that you're seeing in the charts as well, that it becomes a more stretched out rise to the top heading into the late 2020 mark? Well, very often bull markets do end with some sort of parabolic rise, some sort of mm-hmm. vertical ascent. I mean, it's happened in the last gold bull market and silver is very, very, um, you know, it's a, it's a feature of silver. It's a small market. It's a, and on a less um, widely traded market, a little bit like uranium. You know, it's one of these alternative investments where you can get these very spiky moves. You only have to pull up a chart for some of the smaller um, uranium uh, uh, explorers and developers uh, to, to realize just how um, unpredictable some of these moves can be. Well, not unpredictable is probably the wrong, wrong phrase to use when we're talking about technical analysis. But, you know, the, the price can... Uh, move very violently. Um, and I think towards the end of this bull market, it's, it's, it is quite likely to finish with a blow off top. Um, but that is some distance into the future, in, in my view, a number of years um, towards the end of this decade or early next decade. Until then, I think it's going to be a, a case of building momentum, building steam towards a, a gradual realisation that, you know, we have a problem here. And how that problem resolves in several years time is um, is up for debate. 
Can I add something uh, maybe yeah. on, on top uh, of that? FYI, anyone can jump in at any, any time. Yeah. If there's, yeah. cool. Go ahead, this is important, guys. And this, there's, there's two things I had to write them down because I was going to forget. The first thing is we have to, I know that I know nothing. And I know that I know nothing because I know I don't know everything. So if we're there trying to figure out what could happen, what might not happen, I don't see why that could stop. I don't see how it cannot go up. Look, guys, let's be smart about it. Cameco has tons of engineers and analysts working for that company. All these companies, all these analysts, all these hedge funds. I know I'm repeating myself, but there, there's a plethora. There's 10,000 analysts covering this. And then after that, there's purchasing power destruction. There's deflation events, inflation events. And that's driving the price a lot more than supply and demand, which I think is a consequence of the capital flows. It's a symptom, not the root cause. Supply and demand is not the root cause of the price. It might drive the cycle shorter term cycles, but the longer term cycles, we all know what it is. It's a huge breakdown in gold, uh, in SPX versus gold or gold versus SPX or versus PPI. And that's what enacts these crazy commodity bull runs or these crazy growth runs. So that's, I know I know nothing, but the second thing is guys don't get trapped. And this happened to the Bitcoin guys in 2021. The fundamentals will always be bearish after the price becomes bearish. So the price will always peak and crash and the fundamentals will not change. It's always, that thing always repeats. So if you're looking at fundamentals, the news, the, the reason why the price will be crashing because the market participants are smarter than you. They'll start selling this, like all that stuff's gonna happen. And then in hindsight, oh, we're down 30, 40%. Ah, ah it's, it was because of that. No guys, it's, and the bearish news are gonna start increasing during the whole bear market. And at the bottom of the bear market, that's when you have the most bearish news and the cycle repeats over and over. So if you're, the price will peak or go parabolic and the, and we'll feel great about ourselves, but, and then price, as soon as it goes down 10%, 20%, 30% of that parabolic melt up, the new, oh, the news, the fundamentals haven't changed. I'll hold on. And then the price goes down, but the rally up, it's an echo bubble. You're not as high as before. There's technicals starting to break down, but the thesis is right. Look in 2011, the banks were breaking, Greece defaults all over the place. Gold was supposed to sort of 5,000 according to Peter Schiff. Sorry, why do I keep naming people? But and but then the, the gold Maybe price is breaking Kaiser down. Maybe and Peter Schiff on, on this show next. Oh, and there have I you am. on, Patrick, too. Well, I'd well, love they, it. They don't like each other to begin with. So, so the most bullish news happens at market tops and the most bearish news at the bottom. So guys, be really careful of those news followers, you guys out there, because and what you don't see the market participants are smarter than us. They'll show us in the price. It's that simple, you know? We could feel good. I love feeling good about a story, you know? I bought Tesla because I believe in EVs, right? Like the crowd, that's what they do, right? They buy because they believe in the thing. But if that could be fine. You could be lucky and buy when it's breaking out or riding. But if the price is breaking down, respect the price because your theory, who cares about it? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I want to take things to, to Uslink. I know he has to go in, in, in a little bit. So uh, Uslink, same question. So uh, Uslink, same question to you, given the current supply demand gap. Uh, how do you kind of see the rest of this bull market playing out? Do you see more of a 07, uh, 78 spike or uh, something else, something different? And feel free to respond to either Kevin or Patrick's replies as well. Yeah, I think, uh, I hope, you know, that we don't actually see these big spikes, but that we have more of a graduate, you know, stair stepping higher and higher. And then obviously at the end, as I think it was, uh, was it Kevin that mentioned that you had these blow off tops um, where everything just goes bananas, right? But I think, I think, I think and hope that it, this, this, it will be more of a graduate, you know, grinding higher and higher. Um, so, for instance, the U dot U edge chart there. If we top here, then we just have one year worth of sideways action, and then we maybe go higher. Beautiful. That's still insanely bullish. Uh, that's all. That's also why I'm mostly like ninety percent of the time, you know, following the charts, at least for uranium. Uh, and that's also why, you know, whenever you start to, as Patrick mentions, when you start to to read the charts, you you can very often see where what it is trying to tell you. Uh, again, you need to have a very unbiased uh, um, uh, view to it, but definitely looking at the charts and and see what they're trying to tell you and what they're telling to me that is that we have a long way to go. Again, I agree. You know, this move here could end. You know, in like four years time, six years time. Um, but it, it will be a especially for the miners, it will be a very wild ride. You know, with huge legs up and and probably some big pullbacks like 30 40 percent, like we also saw. You know, in the previous bull markets. So again, I'm just, I, I don't know, I, 
I cannot give you an answer to, to your question directly, but I will say, try to follow the charts as good as you can, how skilled as you may, uh, may be, uh, you may be in order to, to follow charts. And I think, yes, the charts will give the, the, um, the correct uh, price or whatever you can say to where we are going for uranium. Um, again, the price is, is the ultimate indicator for me, you know, news and all that good stuff. I don't really use it um, because often the news comes out and, and it's too late. So again, look at the chart. What is it trying to tell you? Look at the ratios and then just try to be as good as you can in order to, to exit because you will not exit at the top. You might exit and then it goes up like another 30% or 40%. But again, yeah, I mean, do whatever you can to 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 time your exit and uh, and be happy about it. I mean, that's all you can do, really. You cannot time the market. You cannot time the top or the bottom. You have to 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 do your best to to get the most meat out of that bone and then and then you're done really so yeah can i just add something to that as well i mean that that uh, supply demand chart just treat it as a piece of evidence don't treat it as the be all and end all mm -hmm. and that's where the story begins and ends it's an interesting piece of evidence and it's um it goes on the pile marked bullish and it goes on the pile that sort of says that it's likely that the you know uranium uh, market is is heading higher but it's it's also you know got to be weighed up against all the other evidence so as with any any kind of forecast production it's all about those probabilities it's all about the evidence and if the charts start to roll over the momentum breaks down below the key moving averages below the breakdown lines below whatever you know technicals on the chart you have to respect that if you don't respect that you could get caught in a very long consolidation like the you know the last Two plus years before, before just before the URA chart broke out, before the uranium miners broke out a few months ago, that was a long consolidation to have your capital tied up. If you just recently entered, if you got in at the lows or near the lows, then okay, fine. But if you if you'd fairly recently entered, that's a long time to have your capital tied up. It's all it's all about when you enter the markets. It's about your market timing, and it's about just weighing the evidence and acting accordingly. You, you should never just put all of your faith into one chart. Or one piece of fundamental news, or you know, look at the look at the big picture, look at everything, and and act on the on the probabilities. I'll keep using that word probabilities. It's all about probabilities, and if you can accurately assess the probabilities, then you've got a you've got a path to success. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, well you think you, yeah, hundred percent. You think you mentioned um, identifying sell, sell side indicators. Uh, I want to ask that question to Andy. What are some sell side indicators that you you would leverage to make an exit from the uranium trade? I think there's a couple of things that I would look at. Um, one of the drivers historically of these market movements in commodities has been uh, real estate and the expansion and credit from that, which is inflationary. When you lose that inflationary push behind you, uh, what you'll see is the inventories of real estate will go up and you'll see forced selling too, a lot of foreclosures and stuff like that. They all kind of come together. You got to get the, you got to run for the exits then because a, a crash is coming. <clears throat> you lose the housing market. It, you'll lose the commodity market too. Uh, just like the 2008 crash, uh, just like the 19, mid 1970s and late, uh, late 1970s, early 80s, we had a oversupply phase. And that demographic <clears throat> is pushing prices around through inflation. So in, in my opinion, if you lose the housing market in the United States, and remember these are priced in dollars, you're, you're losing the denominator there uh, of inflation and weak dollar uh, movement. So that's one area. Another area, if it's pertaining to the commodity itself, watch inventory levels of the specific commodity and watch the supply demand deficit of your production versus the, de the, the the demand supply gap or surplus or deficit. That's adding or subtracting from your inventory level. So um, like we've seen in the housing market, we've got really low inventory levels and you notice the price is not falling. It's just going sideways or slightly even still going higher around the United States. It's the same thing that applies to all of these um, commodities as well. And then what I do is I look at the technicals to basically see how the money is flowing in and out of the sector to validate that what I see and what I'm reading, my interpretation of the fundamentals is the same interpretation as everyone else 
has of the fundamentals. And these guys are exactly right. You can see movements in money flows and the technicals first before any sort of narrative or fundamental piece of news comes out. So it, it's basically the insiders or those who control large sums of money start to move money out of the market. You can see it in the patterns. So I, I try to marry, I mean, this is just me. I try to marry the fundamentals and the technicals and use the technicals as a validation an unbiased way of looking at the markets to see what other people agree with what I'm seeing. And as long as the fundamentals and the technicals look good, I'm going to stay long and, and just try to ride this thing as far as I can. You know, another thing to keep in mind though, the buyers of uranium, like the physical uranium of it, they don't really like, I don't think they really care where the price is at because these are just like, you know, workers that work at these big utilities and they just buy it when they need it. So it, it, I don't know. It's not like they're trying to game the system and get the best price because the price of uranium is so inconsequential to the end user who's using it. Uh, every penny of electricity uh, on the end, on the, on the back end, is about 200 and something dollars of uranium price. I think it's 233 a pound. So each penny upwards in electricity price is $233 a pound uh, on, on the uh, commodity side. So, I mean, you go look at some of these renewable places where they're they're putting all these renewables in. I mean, their electricity prices are 10, 20 cents higher than what they were on fossil fuels, 10, 20 cents. So I'm, you know, when you try to calculate the upper end of where uranium could go, where actually demand gets destroyed. I mean, you can obviously calculate some really ludicrous price levels that something could go to. Um, so I, it, it, uranium is a very weird market because usually a normal commodity market, you've got the cost curves and you, the, the, the price goes a little bit below the cost curves uh, on the bottom end of the high cost producers. On the top end, it's all about demand destruction. And in uranium, we've never actually had a demand destruction event in history where we actually said, you don't get uranium based off price. And everyone I think will say, I don't care what it takes. We can't shut down this nuclear reactor, get it for whatever price. I don't care if it's $2,000 a pound. And, and that's where I think it gets really weird because we've, we're draining the inventory basically to nothing. And it's like, okay, what's next? There's no supply coming online. I mean, there's some supply coming online. There's no great amount of supply that we can see coming in the next couple of years uh, that would really throw this balance uh, in, in favor of a, of a completely bearish market. But again, I agree with these guys. I don't know the future. I can't see the future. And I'm not a, an insider that knows what the inventory is. And I don't think anyone really knows the actual inventory because they hide it in their utilities. So it, it, it's the setup, I think, is there. The momentum's there. And, and we are stretched. I just don't want to lose that position based off of what I know about the fundamentals of the of the uranium sector. I just don't want to lose. And, and you know, you, you can read these books. You read some of these books like the, the Jesse Livermore, um, you know, reminiscences of a stock operator. You start reading this and it's how important it is to keep a position on if you've got all the tailwinds behind you. It's very few people that can just keep holding. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to adopt. It's just hold, 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 even if we get some pullbacks or consolidations. And um, as long as the fundamentals and the inflationary tailwinds are behind me, I'm in it. So that's what I'll say. Yeah. You know, uh, you're kind of alluding there to the fidelity study. We talked about it on uh, on uh, the podcast we had a couple of days ago. Basically, uh, if you don't know, there's a study conducted. A compared a bunch of different trading practices, investment strategies, et cetera. And it, what the upshot of it was, was that uh, dead investors were the, bad inve were, were the best investors, meaning that if you just buy and hold throughout an undetermined amount of time, you, know, you came out ahead of, out of all the other trading uh, strategies there. Uh, Kevin, I know you did a great job uh, kind of walking us through the reason why you, you think CCJ is kind of topped out, uranium is kind of overheated at the moment. We looked at deviation from the uh, moving average, et cetera. Are there any other sell side indicators that you guys use, uh, Kevin or, or, or Patrick, to determine uh, when to sell or exit? 
Yeah, well, <clears throat> it depends on your time frame, doesn't it? It depends whether you're a long-term investor, whether you're swing trading, you know, your particular um, points from a technical charting perspective for entries and exits will, you know, center around a particular number of indicators and support and resistance lines. One that we use um, a lot and has proven to be, well, um, incredibly effective, actually. I was going to say surprisingly effective, but uh, I probably shouldn't be surprised, is the distance from moving average. So whatever time frame you're on, if it's a daily, a weekly, a monthly or a quarterly chart, if your um, instrument has enough history, and they don't all, of course, some don't reflect past bull markets and bear markets, but if you can find a, um, you know, if your particular, Cameco is a good example, you know, that you've got plenty of price history there. You can see when that stock is becoming historically stretched from its moving average. You can see when URA is becoming historically stretched from the moving average or the spot price of uranium. So the um, that that would be one that I would I would use a lot, and also just simple um, horizontal resistance levels, clearly identifiable through uh, volume profiling and through um, simple you know technical chart analysis. You can identify points on the chart where the candles uh, find support and resistance in the past, and they often line up in a horizontal zone of of resistance. So if you're moving up and you've broken out, and you can identify an overhead um, resistance level. That also coincides with the point at which you're stretched from a moving average and also coincides with your measured move then that is clearly a, a, a point at which the price is likely to reach and then pull back for an indeterminate amount of time a strong bull market or probably a short period of time and if the uh, the bull market is needing you know not longer to sort of cool off then that that pullback could take a year or two but you know the I would definitely recommend that people look at um, distance from moving average, look at where your horizontal resistance levels are. And that's proven to be you know, very, very effective for, for us. Just on one other point as well, and there's a, there's a chart I wanted to share with you before I uh, completely forget about it. Um, and I'll just sw switch my screen sharing on for a moment. Um, just um, be aware of, of black swans as well, because this chart here, uh, we haven't really we haven't really discussed this yet, but um, the yield curve, the uh, this is the ten year yield minus the two year yield, is currently inverted. So the ten year yield minus the two year yield is a negative number at the moment. Now, if you go back historically and look at what happens when you have an inverted yield curve, the um, the, the graph interacts with the zero line. That's the red line here, and when it comes back and uninverts, when your yield curve uninverts. Pretty soon afterwards, there or thereabouts, you get a major um, geopolitical economic event. I mean, we've got the early 90s recession there. We've got the Asian crisis when it interacted with the zero line here. You've got the dot-com bust. You've got the great financial crisis, subprime crisis, repo, liquidity, and COVID events. So I don't know what's coming. Um, but what I do know is that we have got a historically inverted um, yield curve and the period of time that it's been inverted is getting to some pretty um, historic levels as well. Now it's showing signs of uninverting um, when it interacts with that zero line and begins to move to the upside again and the yield curve uninverts. Um, I think we've got some kind of named crisis coming. I don't know what it's going to be called. I don't know if it's going to be a banking crisis centered on um, housing or whether it's going to be centered in the financial markets or, or what exactly. But this is a, a potential black swan that we all need to be aware of. I've got a risk matrix here stolen from uh, meteorology. We use this risk matrix for weather warnings. But um, what I'm saying here is that we have a high impact event. The, the tick in this matrix is in the right hand column. So I'm suggesting that some point in the not too distant future, we're going to have a high impact event that is comparable to these previous high impact events. The current risk of that or the current likelihood of that is, um, in my assessment, quite low because we are still a reasonable um, distance from interacting with that zero line. But as we start to approach and touch that zero line, in my view, the likelihood of a high impact event will move up to medium and then in due course to a high likelihood of a high impact event. So um, that type of possible liquidity um, type crisis could take down cryptocurrencies could take down stock markets it could take down gold silver commodities and of course uranium so 
we've just got to be aware of how this event, whether it happens this year or whether it gets pushed to the right and happens in 18 months' time, whenever it happens, it, it, I just wanted to mention that because it, you know, if you're not looking at that and not considering it, then um, you're, you're missing a little piece of the jigsaw puzzle there. I just wanted to throw that little little grenade into the um, into the overall mix. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, just can, can I can I just say him. yeah? Just before I go, a uh, great point there by Kevin, and also as you mentioned, the the depth and the duration of that, you know, below the, the zero line again, should indicate that what we that it, this could be something that is much bigger than we have seen previously. Uh, again, we do not know what's going to happen, but definitely the depth and the duration. I, I agree that if that if and when that happens, when that happens, obviously that is going to. You should take that very seriously. I agree. That could take down a lot of stuff before everything resets and and goes back to a normal mode again. So great point. Great point. I think people are probably wondering, listening to this, thinking, well, okay, great. So what do I do? I mean, my general advice would be to exit the markets and just sit in cash until the dust settles. That that would be about my only sort of thought on that because we don't know how severe, how long, which markets. Um, of course, we can use the technical charts to identify perhaps in advance if the stock markets are breaking down or if precious metals or uranium are breaking down. But it may be a time to just um, sit in, sit firmly in, in a cash position. Um, I don't know what other people's view on that is, but it's it's just my sort of general outline sort of uh, opinion at the moment. Well, for that that, tar that chart, uh, I did that. I didn't have the two years going back, but if you do the 10 year minus the Fed fund rate, which goes back further in the mm. 70s. You guys would be surprised, but we were that low. We came back close up and it went even lower than the low we had mm. here. It did that twice. So, mm. was like, it the 10 year minus the Fed funds rate? Yeah. So, uh, I probably have that. So, if, if you do that, it, it, it went deep in the 70s, deep. And that, that was a crazy oil, uranium, like everything went bonkers in commodities. So, are we having a 2000 scenarios, a 70, a hybrid? But the quick, like Kevin said, if it uninverts, be careful. But if it doesn't go back above zero and just bounces down, then it's something, it's like, it could happen. Like that thing could just keep going down there. Like for how, how long? I don't know, but it could. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I often hear the the narrative that when the yield curve inverts is when, you know, you see a recession. But what you've demonstrated there, Kevin, is that it actually, the recession typically happens or the big event typically happens after it uninverts. And that's yes, when it's when it unwinds. Talk. And as Pat said, that yeah. could be some time into the future. Hence, the risk matrix saying it's a low likelihood of a high impact event at the moment, because um, we are not close enough to that zero line to start panicking just yet. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's something that we're keeping an eye on for, mm -hmm. for everybody. So uh, given the low likelihood event, how do you reconcile that with uh, what you just said to to? If you if you had a choice, you would stay in cash. If it's such yes, a it, when if and when it starts to interact with that zero line, oh, okay. at, the moment, at the moment it's a low likelihood of a high impact event. As it starts to interact with the zero line, that moves closer towards a high likelihood of a high impact event. It's a question of we know it's going to be a, a high impact event, but what is the probability that's going to be happening in the next few weeks or months? At the moment, that probability is relatively low. Uh, as Pat said, it could you know the chart could uh, turn much lower and continue like it did in the 1970s, below the zero line for an extended period of time, which would be great, as Pat mentioned, for commodities, uranium potentially. Um, so it's uh, it's something to keep an eye on um, and uh, and no more than that at the moment. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, you just think, uh, is there anything yeah. you wanted to add in? Yeah, just before I go out the door here, again, I think it's a good point that Kevin has, at least if that event happens, you should have some sort of cash available to deploy and take advantage of that when uh, when it all unwinds after the big crash whatever uh, because if you sit 100% of your of your uh, what what you're worth into stocks it's going to be heck of painful then it's better to have like 50% or like 70% in the market at least you have 30% to deploy when you when you uh, get some great offers you know from equities pulling back or whatever it may be so yeah i, I completely agree have some ammo to, to, uh, to to gain from that event, and then there's, there's, there's never any need to to um, worry about exiting um, because you can re-enter the markets as the dust settles. So you know, if the charts break down, if the stock market starts to break down, why would you be in it anyway? You know, you you just exit, take your profits, let the market do its thing, and then when it breaks out again, you can be back in in a matter of minutes. You know, so 
it, it's not a it's not something that people need to necessarily fear. I know there are implications, tax implications, and that kind of thing. But when you're when you're looking at the potential for a I don't know a 30, 40 percent drop, something crazy that might take many many months to recover, then you know it, it's better to to exit early on and then to redeploy um, more strategically. You know, I, I so for me it's about risk analysis. It's about um, assessing the risk and the likelihoods and the probabilities but each each trader investor has a has a different technique i suppose gotcha uh you, you just think uh do you have another thing you want to add because you're raising your hand no i'm just gonna leave the meeting here leave the the interview here so thank you for everyone for being here and uh a pleasure as always and yeah, yeah. we will uh, do it again like plug your socials uh it, it is use link INV on both youtube and twitter so you can find me there hopefully you can join and have we will uh write this bull market together so Fantastic. We'll have uh, everyone's socials down in the description box below as well. So just uh, awesome. right there. be sure to follow awesome. everyone. Bye, guys. Thank you. See you, man. Cheers, Casper. Bye. All right. Uh, so, Patrick, I'm going to ask you the same question. What are some sell side ind indications that you look at, whether it be for exiting the uranium trade or just in, in trading in general, if it or if, or if it differs at all from what Kevin just talked about? Well, essentially, you have building blocks that got you in the trade and that's your evidence cluster. And as that evidence cluster starts degrading, then that 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 those are warning signs. The faster you exit as the fewer of these elements uh, disappear, you're selling to strength. But if you wait for the whole cluster of evidence to disappear, then you're selling into weakness. So it, there's a trade-off. People choose, like uh, Andy says, if you sell into strength or you think you're selling to strength and there's more strength, you sold to, you know, you, 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 you sold uh, maybe too early. But if you wait, there's too much weakness. Then you're 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 selling lower. So, but uh, I, I Kevin didn't mention it. But what's really great is just classical TA, classical chart trading, measured moves. You know, often we've realized that distance from MA and it's like the the depth added to the breakout line. You know, the bigger the pattern, sometimes you could you, you could overshoot that uh, pull flags like these things. They they were great. They seriously, they, there's a high probability that once you've done a measured move, the energy's been uh, used up. You're stretched from DMA. There's a small reset or longer. We just don't know. So just classical TA on top of that. If um, you're not stretched from moving averages and you're historically stretched but hitting resistance, combined with classical TA measured moves and both of those and hitting a wall of previous support and resistance, when you have like a trifecta of evidence telling you, look, this is a high probability area where you can hit resistance, that's a great entry to sell into strength, especially if the news is just bonkers, which usually it, it's most often is. So I just add that on top there, how to, how to exit into a strength. And, or if, after that, selling to weakness, if you're starting losing your moving averages, et cetera. But uh, measured moves are great to sell into strength. Yep, 100%. Uh, Andy, I want to take it back to you. We're going to shift away from uranium. I think that's... Uh... You know, I think that's enough uranium for for now. Uh, but let's go ahead and look at commodity the commodity complex in general. Uh, is there and what are you most bullish on at the moment, whether it be uranium or something else? Well, uranium it looks pretty good, and the momentum's in favor of it. But uh, obviously, it is overstretched, so you're going to have to balance what you want to do there. I don't think it's. You know, you can be bullish on something and it can be um, not a very good entry point. They're, those are two different things. I'm bullish on uranium, but I don't think that they're, that every company in the uranium sector is a good entry point. <laughs> There's some good entry points that are lagging. There are some that I'm like, uh, I'm going to pass. So I, I want to make that distinction. Um, I think oil is starting to, I think we're trying to put in a bottom. We're starting to try to break some of these downtrend lines. Uh, in oil, we're sitting on top of the consolidation. So it's still early. And I think it's one to watch. And I am getting more and more bullish on it as we continue to stay above things and could potentially uh, break to the upside. And where the yield curve is located that Kevin was talking about, uh, when that starts to uninvert, whenever that does occur, uh, generally oil has some blow off move to the upside. Uh, that occurred in 2008. It occurred in the uh, late 70s, 80s uh, move. 
And I think we still have that ahead of us. So with where it's located and how we're sitting on top of the pattern, I can, I guess, bring that up. Um, and let me, let me give me a couple seconds to yank it up here and throw it on a uh, log here and I'll share it here in two seconds, one second. So, I mean, I think this has a lot of potential to uh, jump from this support level here uh, to the upside. And we've seen this type of fractal as well. It's very similar to the previous bull markets fractal here uh, of, of how this is basically behaving. Um, it's very, very similar of how this is all behaving right now. And this is just the first, I'll call it the first wave, second wave, and then we get a third and a fifth. Uh, I think we still have a long ways ahead of us for crude oil to appreciate. Uh, also, crude oil and uranium, uh, they generally peak roughly at the same price historically. Uh, they get somewhere in the same ballpark. And we're seeing evidence that uranium is taking off and it's obviously at a higher price than crude oil. So if that relationship does hold, uh, I think crude oil's got more upside in this. Uh, if you zoom into the to the shorter term, and again, guys, the shorter term, it can go in either direction for any reason, news or whatever. But I think we've got a nice little trend line that we're trying to break out of, doing like a little bit of maybe of a retest, maybe we'll see uh, how this kind of punches through. But oil, I don't know how it's being priced at $73 a barrel. And all of the geopolitical tensions in the system, it's like there's no geo geopolitics priced in this oil. I mean, the whole world took all of their SPR barrels to basically force this thing lower. They dumped it in mass uh, all at the same time, raised rates through the roof, and all they could muster was to get it back to 70, you know, 60 something, 70 something bucks. Uh, so with how the world is, operating, sitting on top of this big pattern that we're on and the potential break here of of maybe the short term and all the geopolitical tensions. I like oil quite a bit and you can buy equities that are paying huge dividends uh, to sit in it with a bunch of upside potential. So I think crude oil is one spot that uh, I would be looking at. I think I don't think the geo, geo you know the geopolitical tensions. I don't think it's priced in it. Uh, I think the, the a lot of the companies are really cheap. If you look at it from uh, enterprise value to cash flow, uh, they're trading at like two times. So their enter, their market cap is two times the price of their cash flow that they're gonna that they're getting in 2023 and 24. Uh, with where we're sitting on crude oil, I mean, if crude oil goes up just a little bit, I think these things are going to explode uh, to the upside. We can look at the Dukes, drilled uncompleted wells. They basically depleted all those inventories of drilled uncompleted wells. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, activity in the drilling sector in terms of tenders in the Middle East, tenders around uh, other areas in the world. Uh, we've got, yeah, low drill, low drill holes or drilled uncompleted wells. It, it just seems like a really good setup. Uh, we can also look at crude oil versus gold. Uh, we are still at a very cheap uh, ratio perspective there. Uh, we basically almost got to 30 to one, 30 barrels to one ounce of gold. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a really good setup and it's still very cheap. So I, I don't see any huge valuation flags uh, in this. And, and technically, I think it's still holding up. We just got to get a little bit more buying pressure in this thing. Uh, and, and I think we're going to rip. I, I also think, you know, we broke the the short-term downtrend in yields, the 10-year yields starting to move on up and yields and oil generally move together. So I, I just see a lot of alignment out there that oil could start to gather itself here and, and start moving on up, but it's still early. So WTI is uh, a, yeah. And if you, uh, we looked at the uranium versus oil price the other day, uranium's actually had a pretty significant run up versus the price of oil. So that kind of, as to your point as well, Andy. And uh, sentiment wise, um, if you look at the sentiment indicators, this has been, I think, the lowest it's ever been uh, for oil in a, hmm. I think that that chart went all the way back to like the 80s, I think. I mean, the sentiment is just totally washed out in oil. So nobody cares about it. 
Oh, yeah. I, I pulled up Google Trends uh, looking at oil stocks. Here, I'll share the screen real quick. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, yet it's big spike. I think it's going to start to come on up. Yep. So your index at at six relative to the spike here in 2020 when oil went down to like minus 30. There's a lot of interest in buying oil stocks, but uh, but yeah, it's um, sentiment looks pretty pretty shot. Okay, uh, Kevin, same question to you. Most bullish sector at the moment doesn't have to be commodities, FYI. But uh, what what do you think? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> difficult actually. Looking at the commodities sector um, as a whole, there's quite a lot of weakness in there still, as uh, Andy mentioned. Oil um, hasn't been doing a great deal recently, but does have quite a lot of potential in a similar de degree. So do precious metals, gold and silver. I'll just show you uh, a couple of charts for precious metals. I'll share my screen again for you if you give me a second. Um, so it's it's been a, a, a pretty sort of, um, how can I put it, uh, sort of um, difficult period for precious metals, quite hard to get a, a handle on just exactly what's going on. Gold, um, if you analyze just this section of the chart here on the right hand side, uh, we've broken above the horizontal sort of breakout level, which is in the region of around about $2,000, stretches between about $1990 and $2,000. And we've broken out uh, from that. In fact, I can show you the Renko chart, which is a, another way of analyzing um, the, the gold price and with uh, the Renko chart, I think these blocks are set at $60 block size. So you need to go up $60 for a new block to be put in place mm -hmm. or down $60 for a, a red block to be put in place. Um, it can take days, weeks, months, or goodness knows how long for a block to appear. It just gets plonked there when when the price has uh, closed that, uh, that week at, uh, at that level $60 higher. So that's how the chart works. And you can see quite clearly from this Renko chart, there's a, there's a pretty clear breakout. And it's pretty pretty much the same on the straightforward price chart as well. We've got this cup and handle type pattern with a breakout, as I say, anywhere sort of around about $1990, $2,000 on this uh, Renko chart. It's around about 1980. Hey, hey Kevin. Sorry, mm. don't mean to interrupt. But for people who may not know, what's why would you use a Renko chart as opposed to just a traditional candlestick chart? It's, it's another piece of evidence. It's a, it's a way of um, getting a clean, clear analysis. It kind of is noise reduction is the way I, I look at it. So rather than having lots of squiggles in that $60 price range, which might have taken you know several weeks, um, all you end up with is a single block. And you get a single, clean, clear green block or red block when you get that $60 uh, price change. Um, so... It's, it's, a, it's a question of um, getting an, a, a, another sort of way of analyzing the chart and a, another piece of evidence. If you get a breakout um, using the Renko blocks, it's, an, it's another little piece of um, bullish evidence um, and another way of sort of trying to, you know, sometimes you look at line charts, sometimes you look at candle charts, mm. sometimes your support and resistance lines work best by putting on on the candle wicks. Sometimes they go on the, the body of the candle. And in reality, what you've actually got is a zone of support and a zone of resistance. There's no, it's never really a simple, clear line. But with the Renko blocks, it does allow you to sort of see those uh, support and resistance levels really quite clearly. So for me, it's just a, looking at it through a different lens. But um, when we look at the gold chart on a more traditional monthly candle chart, um, again, if we zoom right in, we can put that horizontal line in. I haven't got it on this chart, so I'll just put it on for you there. And that horizontal line goes there, okay, that red line. And we've broken out, and we're back testing that, that level, that breakout level. But if you take the 2011 data point into consideration all the way back here, you could argue that we haven't actually broken out yet. And this pattern is, uh, it's a big, big pattern that goes all the way back over 20 years, all the way down here, where we broke out into the last bull market in the early 2000s. So uh, there's a lot going on here. And what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that a clear breakout from this particular pattern would have, um, you know, big implications because it's kind of like the last it's the last way you can analyze this chart and say it hasn't broken out yet. If you're looking for um, a gold chart that hasn't 
shown a breakout yet, then this is probably your your last sort of line of defence, that that upper red line. So we're looking for a breakout above that. Now, if we don't get that pretty soon in the next, I would say, month or two, then uh, we start meandering into this sort of zone closer towards the apex of this uh, of this triangle. Makes it a little bit more likely that we're going to come down and test support somewhere in the mid 1800s, which would be a shock to a lot of people. Um, but that support line um, goes back to the previous breakout there, the, the breakout into the bull market, and it takes in that low point there and the more recent low point here in, in 2022. So what I'm saying to you is that gold and silver are um, close to a big breakout. When we get these confirmed breakouts, and here's the silver chart trying to work its way through a 44-year cup and handle pattern. If I zoom right out, you'll see all 44 years. And you know what's the target of a 44-year cup and well, actually, you could call it a cup and a cup pattern, couldn't you? Because the the handle part of it is actually another another cup. So, you know, what is the target for that? Well, I would suggest you know probably somewhere in the region of triple figures, getting towards a hundred dollars or so. But the first target, well before that, is the sort of thirty eight to fifty dollar level, that resistance zone that you can see. And we're not going to have a shot at that until we break out through this newly defined. Uh, resistance line, which is going to be somewhere around about twenty, just over twenty-five dollars. So until we get a monthly close above twenty-five, we're still wading through treacle here, trying to trying to sort of gain some traction to the upside. But um, into, yeah, I mean, my I'm looking at uranium, I'm looking at silver. Silver still in a in a, a what I would call an accumulation zone. If you're a, if you're a stacker, you're wanting to get silver whilst it's still um at, at very sort of relatively low valuations then now is probably the time to be sort of continuing to accumulate your your stack of silver uh, but once it breaks out here then the move is underway pretty quickly and you're you're likely to sort of um sort of uh, leave those lower prices behind pretty pretty rapidly so that's the roadmap i mean that particular roadmap i haven't changed in the last four years and it served us well the only uh, deviation from that roadmap was the covid low and that created what is a potential sort of outer arc. So if we were to get some kind of economic event, some kind of meltdown, then that outer arc has been fixed in position by the COVID low. So that's always worth bearing in mind. And that gives an absolute low uh, low point of just below $20 if that was to be hit. Uh, interesting that we're just threatening to break below that inner arc, which has guided us all the way since 2020. So let's see where the monthly the monthly close takes us. Um, it's going to be interesting to see. But I mentioned the the commodity uh, complex as, as a whole. Here we've got the uh, DB Commodity Index uh, Tracking Fund, which needs to break out above twenty five to twenty seven to give us the second wave of a potentially sort of um, inflationary um, surge in in, the, in in commodities. There are several indices here. I've got the Bloomberg Commodity Index um, as well. And again, very rapid upside move, which was um, which I suggested was likely back in April 2020. Actually, when we got the false breakdown, um, we hit resistance, hit the um, previous highs, and since then we've been pulling all the way back to try and find support, which will probably come in somewhere around about ninety ninety dollars or just above. Also, got the CRB index, which uh, also reflects that recent pullback. Big big pattern there, breakout from a very large bullish descending wedge, a little bit like the um, the 10 year yield chart where we had a 40 year descending bullish wedge with a false breakdown and a rapid upside reversal. So this chart does actually in a way mirror, um, albeit on a smaller time scale, the, um, the 10 year yield breakout um, and the recent uh, consolidation pullback. So this at, at the moment um, is finding support uh, close to around about two, $250 or thereabouts. And it's not really until we get above about uh, 290 that this is sort of firing on all cylinders again and heading into a, a renewed upward surge. So uh, like oil, you know, as Andy said, with oil, um, I've got oil sitting on um, support there. This is this is the uh, WTI, West Texas uh, oil uh, chart. Breakout, surge to the upside, hitting that uh, resistance zone back down to the sort of $70 level, finding support. Um, if that support holds, then um, it looks like the 100 to 115 resistance level becomes the na next natural target. So uh, my my views on that are similar to Andy's, I think. So a lot to keep an eye on. Um, 
you know, the, the, the sector, the commodity sector as a whole, I, I expect to heat up again um, over the next year or two. But as always with commodities, they tend to fire at different times. You know, we've had zinc, we've had lumber, you know, we've had various commodities, we've had upside spikes in uranium, you know, we, copper hasn't uh, um, particularly done anything very exciting for quite a while now. Copper, Dr. Copper, of course, um, meant to be a, an indicator of uh, global economic health. And uh, that's until it breaks above four and a half to four, four and three quarter dollars. It's uh, it's just sort of meandering sideways. But again, an interesting looking chart for copper there as well, potentially going forwards over the next uh, year or so. So again, a, a lot to keep an eye on there. But my my tip when it breaks out would be uh, would be silver. Silver. So, okay. Yeah. I I... I, I know that what you're saying had definitely has merit because when you say silver, I'm just like, oh, <laughs> that's typically a good sign, right? You want to go against your gut feeling. Like, oh, uh, I really want like, to put more money in silver miners. Yeah, yeah. Because sil I feel that way. It's, silver, what I it's a do. dirty word. You know, you put that out there on Twitter, you take a lot of abuse, but, you know, it's it's a dirty word at the moment. That's a, that's a good contrarian indicator. It's pretty much what people thought of uranium a few years ago when I first started posting about that. So uh, let's uh, let's hope, eh? <laughs> yeah, I started my channel around this time last year. And when I started posting about uranium, I had the most hate and vitriol from the uranium community because they were like, <laughs> oh, this is a, you're, you're so late to this trade. This is a dead trade. And in my <laughs> mind, it was like, that's a sign that we've actually bottomed. And we, point of fact, we did mid-2022 when we actually bottomed from, from this consolidation period. So the fact that you say silver miners, I feel the same way about silver miners as, as I felt about uranium miners a year ago. So that's uh, very, very telling. Mine, miners, precious metal miners, there there are times to own them and very long periods in time not to own them. Um, you know, as, as a general rule over the last 50 years, miners suck. Um, but there are short yeah. periods in time where they it make up really for does, it. It really does time. pay to be invested in the miners. And if you can identify the entry points, then it, it really does uh, pay dividends. Yeah. Uh, if, if not, I, just buy the metal, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Risk free, um, less jurisdictional risk. Yeah. Hold in your hands. Uh, Patrick, same question to you. What are you most bullish on at the moment, commodities or otherwise? Well, it gets tricky. So the, the oil, the XOP has broken down versus NVIDIA. So we could turn a blind eye to what's happening in tech. Sometimes a pattern, a bullish pattern, not all bullish runs are playable. Sometimes you like, Everybody has their framework. They want, to, but right now it's like it's full steam ahead. SPX Tech. I, I'm, I've, I went through those charts there. Goodness gracious, it's like that. There's a lot of money going there. But then comes the dividends because I just had a flash there because while we might think the XOP or a whole bunch of these oil plays they're cheap, when you, the dividend adjusted ones are practically at their targets, their stretch for moving averages. Take. A, I don't know, I can't, I can't come to my head, but when those paying 10, 20% dividends, and yes, guys, oil companies, most of them, 10, 15, 20% there, well, 20% probably the top range, but in drilling companies, like huge dividends, the prices are low because they're paying out a lot of dividends, right? The market has to, okay, well, that money has to come from somewhere, but on trading view, you could adjust for dividends and you'll see these things have been in bull runs, uh, ninja bull runs, because you could just hold them, price going sideways, creeping up tiny a bit, but goodness, you're, you're NAV, you're getting paid these dividends and you're actually outperforming the tech. So that's probably my next series of charts, Kevin, I'm going to do is going to be the dividend adjusted version of these uh, these oil plays. I just had a flash because I, I told you that NVIDIA was breaking out versus XOP, but that I took the non-dividend adjusted version. So if I take a few of these uh, oil plays, dividend adjusted, they're probably X equal and probably outperforming the... Uh, so there's that, there's coal. Nobody's talking about coal because coal went parabolic. It went down and now coal is coal, waking up. Shipping, uh, marine shipping, um, even uh, these companies doing uh, drilling equipment, anything related to these oil rigs, man, those charts are bonkers with dividends. Nobody's talking about this stuff. So yes, the oil price is lagging, but the the the, the, the explorers, gas producers, dividend adjusted, they've been doing great. Seriously, they've been doing, they've been doing fine there. Like nobody's talking about that. So, yeah, that's probably what I'm looking at. Of course, uranium, uh, some are stretched, time to take profits, but other ones are just like, you know, they're little, the eggs are ready to hatch. So that's the best time to, to get some of those. And um, yeah, you got, always got to be uh, mindful of the, uh, of the whole bunch of, of sectors. And that's what's important, guys. 
if you're not stuck in one thesis or in one chart that's going sideways and then you're just holding on and your 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 nav is 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 uh, is frozen in there it's harder emotionally to look around where other sectors are breaking out that you're not aware of that you could be making great gains so let's say i was full bullish uh, silver like in 2020 it went, it went bonkers it was time to go but when it was time to start to exit there was maybe these other cryptos going bonkers that you should have been looking at you know to 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 make profit so yeah, I don't want to go too much on tangent, but the, those sectors I named, they, they are heating up and there's a, there's great opportunities um, happening in that in those sectors, right? Yeah, yeah. I want to next, we're closing in on two hours, uh, by the way. Uh, is everyone cool with keeping going? I, I don't want to hold you guys hostage, FYI. I know Andy needs to eat breakfast. Uh, you know, it's getting a little late there for, for Patrick. If I don't eat in the next half hour, I'm going to waste away, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, one one last question. Quick question. Uh, actually, I want to open up the forum to you guys. Do you do either uh, of you three have any questions for the other two that you want to pose? Yes, Go I have ahead. one for for Andy because Kevin, I could ask him questions all the time. What are you going to do, Andy? Let's say the the fundamentals are one hundred percent intact. But I think I might have asked you that, but maybe good. But the price breaks down 30 percent but the fundamentals are still intact you, what's your game plan for that like a 30 percent drawdown or maybe that yeah. you can do i've already gone through a couple of those um i've gone through like three or four 50 percent 40 50 percent pullbacks in some of the companies they were short uh and and quite quite steep very you know quick ones and then we've gone to higher highs from that so uh, i've ridden through it Okay, and I'll, I'll through... make it trickier for you. I'll make it trickier because now, of course, let's mm -hmm. say I'm back in 2011. There's that gold. We have that 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 massive top of gold. You know, to 2011 to 2013, it breaks down. So I, I forget what level, 1500, 1600. It's breaking down versus SPX, all that. And let's say the fundamentals were still good for you in your mind, right? Like let's say for whatever reason, the, but the price is like this is not this is not this is a huge top that's breaking down. Do you, you hold on or you you dump and you you move on? You say, okay, well, maybe so, my. So what I, what I would have done, knowing where we were in the cycle, I would have been heavy in tech in two thousand nine, and been riding tech the whole the whole way, and I would have exited tech in twenty twenty into commodities. As as the big business cycle movement, so I, I know uh, gold does real well from. Like that that crash, like probably 08 to 2011 would have been a really good time to own gold. But I would have already probably been buying a lot of tech in, in 08, 09, and 2010 and been holding it. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll rephrase my question. And... For, for, forget gold. Forget for, forget the, the – I show you a chart. It's mm -hmm. clear topping. It's breaking down. But it's contrary to your thesis at that moment. Forget what it is. You're what do you do? You tell me that's never going to happen. Well, it's already happened. Uh, so I've had price move against me in oil and that gas. Uh, and I've continued to hold because I think that the uh, overall real estate inflationary period is still behind me. So when I lose that, I'm out. Uh, okay, it, but it's, how are you going to lose the, it on the chart though? It's going to be a chart telling you that you've lost it, right? For the macro- Well, it's going to be a combination of multiple things. It will be the real estate market going with inventory going up. Uh, that's when you lose your your demographic, so to speak. So I'm, I'm playing something completely different. I'm playing the business real estate cycles is yeah. what I'm playing. And it's overlaid on uh, the charts are all kind of the backdrop of it. It's it's like evidence that I'm collecting that the cycle is is still existing. So it'd be like buying in the it'd be like buying 1969 and selling the high in 74 because inventories rose in 74. Uh, and then we had a crash from the real estate market. And then that real estate market went into another cycle in the late 70s from the demographic coming into home buying years, which had another inflationary impulse move up. The same thing occurred from 98 to 2008. Well, it was really that we peaked in the housing starts in 05, 06. 05, it started coming down. The inventory started to go up uh, in 06, 07. Then you got to get out. That's, that's like your exit point for commodities is 07, 08. 
But there is a chart, though. That's, that's chartable uh, evidence. I was, I was about to say, yeah, I was, I was about that. to say. You could chart the supply. You could chart whatever you're, because I'm trying to, because some people In don't have going up. based it's... evidence and they have a narrative. But when do you know that the, the supply is not there anymore? The inventory is crumbling. How do you know? Like, seriously, you don't, you need there, it. There must, there must be a breakout level for the inventory. You talk about inventory going up. You'll be looking at the chart to find out when it's broken out above a particular level, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Like, so it's it's like a um, it's like an evidence that stacks together where you get like all these things that align at the top, and I'm like, mm -hmm. boom, I'm out. So it's like uh, inventory going above eight months of of supply okay. in the United States. Okay, There's one it. threshold level. Bam, it's hit. Okay. And it's like now I'm looking at the charts to exit, and what are the charts? You know, what are they telling me? What are they? Are they are they starting to roll over? Are we losing momentum? Uh, are we? breaking uptrend lines, those steep up uptrend lines, which will then turn into a horizontal trend line, just like you know, you know, where you break it and then you start doing a, a stage four top or stage three top uh, of, of stage analysis, or it, are you looking at a Wyckoff distribution top? You know, wh whatever those things look like, you could get a huge spike in a, in a commodity that gets a big tail at the top and you're like, I'm out, <laughs> see ya. Um, but I'm looking for like an alignment and if you've got expensive ratios too, which hopefully we have at the top, you, you get all these that align like an expensive ratio, the inventory is coming on up, you're losing your inflationary, I'll call it cover, and the markets are starting to shift into a disinflationary environment, the yield curve is going to be inverted and starts to uninvert. All of these things come into alignment and I'm like, gone. Like, see, ya. I'll sell all my stuff, sit in probably treasury bonds or something like that wait for the crash to go. I make another 10, 20% in the bond because bond yields drop. And then I'll, I'll buy at the bottom like technology stocks in a low inflation, low low uh, interest rate environment. And then I'll ride that uh, through that part of the cycle. That sounds, that sounds quite um, similar to go, the evidence yep. clusters. It's all it's all chart defined. Same thing. Yeah. It's You say your fundamentals, but you're chart defined because the charts are creating your fundamental uh, thesis. You you don't have a thesis and trying to force it on the charts. The the actual metrics in the charts are telling you what your thesis should be. That's what I. That's how I derived the thesis. Correct. Yes. I derived it from charts and and, yes. and data. So I back. I basically I looked at all the charts, but backdated and said this is what's my met. It's basically using it uh, the charts as measuring sticks or evidence to kind of stack it all together, yeah. similar to what you guys do. Uh, but I'm just playing the real estate cycle, and that cycle is where. At, you get money flows moving from one sector to another sector during certain portions of it. So I'm just using bit, the charts like to have an... comparing everything to the SPX, isn't it? If you chart everything versus the S and P, or you price everything in gold, then you're identifying cyclical behavior in the markets. One hundred percent agree. Yeah, you can use ratios to see how the money's flowing from one sector to another, and it will also give you further evidence of where you are at in the cycle. And that's why commodities are coming up because the expansionary phase of real estate and commodities go up together. Mm. So I, I'm watching it and I'm like, all right, I'm just going to stay long until we lose those tailwinds behind us uh, that are pushing these prices higher. Um, they're still behind us. We're just, we have a messed up market right now because they did all this stimulus. They, they dumped a ton of money into the system, which then plays havoc on your yield curve because then your yield curve inverts. Because they're, it's going to raise interest rates, it's going to people are going to sell bonds because of the inflation created by the stimulus, and it's almost like confusing where we're at in the big business real estate cycle. Because we could get a slowdown too. That's very possible because they raised rates from an artificial stimulant. They raised them on up to to slow this artificial stimulus that they put in the system, and then they're doing like backdoor QE at the same time with high rates because they're they're doing fiscal spending just massive fiscal spending and like it's like it's paper it's they're, it's papering over some of the signals and like confusing and muddying some of the signals in the in the market uh where they just continue to put to pump inflation and paper into the market so it's like how accurate are some of these signals now with the yield curve inverting cuz right now if you look at the yield curve generally before a crash you get the two year drops and the tenure, the, the, the curve drops on you and the curve uninverts, the, the short end drops faster than the long end and the yield curve uninverts with everything falling. But if you look at the curve now, you've got the two year that's kind of hanging on, but the 10 years moving up. And I'm like, 
that is funky because we're getting a ton of it's called a bear steepener in the yield curve and we're just getting massive movements on the on the longer end in relationship to the short end uh which really is a pretty rare event and we're also seeing liquidity come back into the in, into the into the uh the system through other measurements which muddies this water quite dramatically uh, liquidity coming in, the yield curve inverted, the bear steepener where the long end's outperforming the the short end, which is uninverting the curve to some degree. And it, it, it's a funky setup. Um, the previous bull markets and the, the previous markets where we had these yield curves uninvert, it was all kind of organically driven. It was organically driven by, uh, you know, demographic interacting with the real estate, creating the credit in the system through loans and all that stuff. But you throw this gigantic impulse surge of stimulus across the board it's kind of like are these measuring sticks right are they distorted are they jacked up which i think they're kind of distorted we're seeing signs of like massive bear steeping where the long ends outperforming the, the short end and that generally occurs in a very small window uh, of time but this is a, a much larger window and we're getting more frequency of it which is kind of weird uh, well, so there, there's a lot of weird things going on that you've thought about this. Uh, you've thought about this a lot, Andy. And when, when I see, I'm so happy because I see, oh my goodness, like you're discovering new moving parts as you're doing your research, right? Because you're not the same Andy you were like a year ago. You know more stuff now, right? You, you like. So I'm just happy I could just rely on the charts because that could be me like discovering all this. And you're right. Sometimes I'm looking at the charts and they don't quite fit like the previous cycle. Seriously, like SPX versus PPI broke down, but SPX didn't break down versus gold yet. And usually that never happens, but gold prices keeps going up. And it's like gold's already in, in, deep in the cycle, but it's not breaking out. But the other stuff that's keep going up, you know, gold's going up that much. The other stuff should be going down, but it's not, you know. So it's with the charts, it's easier to just take a breather. Look, that's the chart. That's my ratio. I have a breakout there. And whatever the 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 mechanic, like the puppet master, whatever's happening behind, it's it's fun to talk about, but you know, it's it's not it shouldn't impact your decision making. The end result of all these puppet stuff, the ones we know about or don't know about, the end result is that is the chart. So but goodness, you're right. Like you're you're saying verbally what we've been seeing in the charts that some stuff doesn't quite make sense. It's like not all like uranium's going bonkers. Have you ever seen silver not go bonkers with uranium going bonkers? You mentioned that oil also. But the move in uranium sector, Nasdaq's breaking down versus uranium, the versus the miners. Like goodness, silver should be uh, above uh, to what it is now, man. In in the in that in the cycle, right? So it's yeah, it's a mixed bag of the uh, evidence. Yeah, it's it's muddied, but I I think we're still before the big commodity boom. I think we had a, a surge of just stimulus money that came through and a little bit of money rotation. I think the big commodity bull market is still ahead of us. Yes, like the big the, 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 uh, there's a chart that I've got, which is the um, the 10 year yield chart. And um, the 10 year yield chart was in decline for over 40 years um, through the 1970s, of course, 1960s and 70s, the 10 year yield rose well up into double figures. And then what happened from that point onwards was something like 44, 45 years of bullish downtrend. Now, when I say bullish downtrend, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But what I mean is that it fell all the way from well over 10% down to 0%. But in the process of doing that, carved out a bullish descending wedge. Something happened um, a couple of, couple of years back where we had a, a false breakdown, a break below that bullish pattern. doesn't make sense with a 10-year yield because to start going negative and staying negative for any period of time just from a, a simple logical point of view is unsustainable. So very quickly at that point, anyone that was looking at that chart, myself included, was pointing at that chart saying, right, this is a false breakdown of a 40 plus year bullish descending wedge. Something's about to happen that is going to completely change the markets for decades to come. Sure enough, that chart accelerated away violently to the upside. Not only did it get back inside the bullish falling wedge, but it busted out above the falling wedge. And I think that breakout level might have been somewhere around about 2%. I can't remember, 2 percent 2 whatever it was, and shot up to 5%. It's now pulling back. And perhaps a lot of people are thinking, oh, okay, we're getting back to situation normal. Wrong. 
because what's just happened is we've broken out of a 40 year bullish descending wedge. And what we're now having is a bullish back test of the breakout. So as Andy just said, my personal view is that you haven't seen anything yet. And that's not based on any kind of um, stories that I'm listening to about, you know, you know, everything's going to go to hell in a handcart because of X, Y, Z. It's based on the technical analysis evidence from that 44 year bullish descending wedge, false breakdown, breakout, bullish back test. It now puts us in an environment completely different to anything that we've seen in the last 40, 50 years. We're back into something that is a version of the 1960s and 70s, where we get waves of inflation across the commodity sector, commodity driven, pushing up producer prices, feeding through into consumer prices in, in some kind of an inexorable trend upwards trend over the next 10 20 i don't know how many years but we're talking about decades probably because of the size of the pattern so do not expect you know my personal view do not expect that the inflation that we've had is done and dusted i expect further waves originating from the commodity sector and the upwards price pressure that's going to put on and that includes oil it includes raw materials it includes soft commodities it includes soybeans and all, all the rest of that stuff that has had a surge to the upside and a pullback. That is just the start of the process, in my in my view, and that view comes from the technical chart analysis. Yeah, yeah. Have you have well, either of you guys looked at the uh, GS the GSCI versus M two money supply? Because it, it really brings home what uh, you guys just talked about here. So this is uh, the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index divided by the by controlling for M two money supply. And yeah. uh, essentially, you've got your big move up here, which is counts for about a 200 some odd percent move from the very bottom here to the top. But when you zoom out to the 80s, right, we've got we've got data that goes back to the 07 commodity super cycle or, or, or 08 rather. But if you can actually zoom all the way out to the 80s and, you know, this thing is still all the way down here. So much to your point, you know, we may have not even seen anything yet. No. No, I, I, I don't believe so. I, the, the, the evidence from that yield chart, from the commodities charts, from gold, silver, uranium, across the board is what we're seeing is likely. I'm not, there are no certainties, so I'm not going to talk in terms of certainties. I'll talk in terms of probabilities. But the probabilities are stacked in favour of the um, conclusion that what we're seeing is the beginning of a trend, not uh, the end of um, a short upward surge in commodity prices inflation but the beginning of an upwards trend that has a, l a very long way to go yet right right uh andy kevin uh any questions you want to post to the forum before we wrap this thing up uh not for me i don't think i've covered pretty much uh everything pretty extensively uh, we haven't mentioned cryptocurrencies very much uh, i inadvertently showed my Bitcoin, Kevin, at the very start Bitcoin there, fixes but... this. Bit Bitcoin fixes the commodity bull era. Bitcoin, Bitcoin fixes, fixes it. Casper fixes it. All sorts of things. <laughs> I've heard fix, fix it. But, um... <laughs> we we, <laughs> we want to really go down that road. Kaiser on the show. We might I want to get Max that, Kaiser and, and Patrick on the show. The I'd love it. I I'm not big enough yet. I need to get like hundred thousand well, more subs. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Like a good debate could be, I, I, I'll i do one in front of, in front of 50 people or a hundred. Yeah. Like, but I mean, for him, for him to come on. Oh, I well. To get him up on the channel. Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't know. Do you want to go through crypto really quick? It's up to you. I, I don't know how much time you have left. I don't, I, I, put, I'm, I don't want to go into all the charts because uh, it would take quite a long time, but okay. the, the, we'll the save essence, it for another time. Yeah. The essence that I'll sum it up pretty quickly. The risk reward isn't in favor of taking an entry at this point. If you haven't, uh, sort of entered somewhere down near 20, 25, 30,000, ridden it to nearly 50 and exited at that point, then uh, this isn't the point to be taking an entry. The risk reward is not in our favor at the moment. We're hitting resistance levels. A pullback is is highly likely in my view. Um, if you look at Bitcoin versus NASDAQ, Bitcoin versus inflation, Bitcoin versus um, uranium, it hasn't made the major breakout that it needs to make to sort of strongly suggest that Bitcoin is in a bona fide strong trending bull market this could ultimately turn out to be a bear market rally now a lot of people are going to hate that um but um there is still a possibility however small and you have to acknowledge that this could be a, a, either a bear market rally or it could be a, 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 a high point where we're about to see a major uh, correction that may well 
not go down as the pre as far as sixteen thousand. It may put in a higher low, but regardless, um, it, the chart is looking to me as though it's, it's it's likely exhausted for the time being. But that's just my personal view. Gotcha, Andy. Yeah. Go ahead. Andy. What I would say about crypto, and I'm sure everybody knows I don't like crypto that much, but um, we don't know how it necessarily behaves in a large increasing interest rate environment, and I think that's a big risk. Because I think it's highly correlated to the NASDAQ, and I don't think the NASDAQ likes increasing interest rate environments. Agree with that. So everybody thinks it's this big inflationary hedge. We'll see. Yeah, That's Jerry, all Jerry is we'll very see. much out on that. Is, so so, so, it, so you know, again, Andy, it, it, you're saying it's different this time for the second time on this on this video. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is crypto's never really experienced a large inflationary yeah. impulse move with increasing interest rates, which I think is coming. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I know oil does really well under that type of environment. That's why I'm bullish on oil, because we've got the pullback in interest rates, which I think is being driven by oil. And I think oil is going to lead interest rates are all going to go up together. And it's like, well, how does crypto do in a large inflationary increasing interest rate environment? I don't know. Like, I, I, we just don't know. It's never been tested in that environment. I think gold and silver will do incredibly well. What if, so, what if that acts as a downward pressure towards Bitcoin miners because of increased energy costs? and thereby brings down the supply. What do you think about that? Oh, no, no. So, so, uh, if, if, if you want to talk like fundamentals, uh, crypto, nobody cares about crypto. Crypto's, in my opinion, kind of just garbage uh, be, in terms of its use case. Everybody just wants what it can buy. That's all they want. It's tulips. Just a it's, a it's a new thing that they want to trade. It's they think it's going to... Oh, yeah. I mean, you could say that about other uh, assets too, but I don't see why anyone's running to crypto because it transacts value across whatever's so great. Like, what is it so good at doing? Sucking in more money so the value goes up and then they pretend like it's a storage of wealth. Uh, but what if we go through tested times? You know, if 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 we go through a real hardship where... where uh, Let's say oil becomes very scarce or energy becomes more scarce. The cost to transact of crypto goes way up and people need to transact to buy things that they really need. Do you think crypto is going to be going up in that type of environment? I mean, they're going to sell their crypto to go buy, you know, energy to heat their house yeah, or when buy rubber, electricity. Rubber hits the road. Drive to work. Yeah. So I, I think it's just an extension of being in what I consider to be a gigantic tech bubble is the way that I view it. I could be wrong, and I'll eat my words if well, it goes up. The charts agree <laughs> with you, Andy. I've done multiple correlation charts. So that's the correlation's not one hundred percent back in the days, but in the past couple of years, it's like it's a dot nine and above. The correlation's there, so quacks like a duck, sounds like a duck. And look, if 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 you're outperforming gold, you ain't money. You just ain't. If you're outperforming purchasing power. You ain't money. It just you're something else. You're speculative. You're growth, which is fine. But people have to admit, because me, what bothers me is they're selling something. It's not to attract people. Oh, sell money, all that. They're using that to sell. There's no evidence for that at all in the charts. It's tracking tech. Just tell people it's a tulip. You'll make money. Get in. Sell somebody higher, and that's it. Just tell people that. They can't. They can't. There's there's no honesty. Yeah, if that's anything, what bothers me a, lo a little bit there. From from, from an investment point of view, I mean, the answer is simple. If if Bitcoin is outperforming other instruments, then fine, buy Bitcoin, yeah. buy buy the point at which it breaks out, sell the point at which it breaks. Treat it like anything else. As an investor, as a trader, treat Bitcoin like anything else, and and you you shouldn't go wrong. You know, it behaves in the same way. It breaks out, it peaks, it tops, it has cycles, it breaks down. It's the chart. For Bitcoin is like the chart for gold, is like the chart for silver, is like the chart for uranium. They all behave in the same way. They all give the same signals for buying, the same signals for selling. You know, avoid the emotion. Don't get caught up in some kind of religious view on Bitcoin or or gold or silver or anything else. Really, you know, if, you, if you're in the, if you're in it as an investor and a trader, just you know, sidestep the emotion and use the technical analysis chart to. To do your trading and, and investing, you know, it, it, yeah. it, you can say the same thing about any any sort of. Um, I mean, hey, listen, I mean, I made the same point on Andy's show a few days ago. I pretty much said, "Don't get married to this stuff." You, a lot of people get married to to a trade, but well, the kicker because is because you ride it all the way down. Yeah, but then you're gonna the 
you're you're going to have to get divorced at some point. <laughs> exactly. So don't, don't, don't fall in love with this date Quit quit when you're winning. Quit yeah. when you're winning. <laughs> this, basically, what you're saying is you're running a pump and dump scheme. Uh, well, yep. well, look. On that note, <laughs> <laughs> I think we peaked. It's only downhill from here. <laughs> it's time to sell all right well uh you know thanks again for coming on guys this was a great panel uh we'll do it again sometime maybe quarterly or something to that effect uh let's go around and drop our socials really quick kevin uh, where can people find you yeah you find me at north star charts on uh twitter and uh northstarbadcharts.com is our uh, website um we've also got a youtube channel north star charts on uh north star bad charts on uh, youtube as well and you can find us both on uh, linkedin um I'll give his details in a moment, I'm sure. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Patrick, you? Bad Charts One on Twitter and uh, NorthstarBadCharts.com, NorthstarBadCharts uh, on YouTube. Okay, Andy? Now on Twitter, you can find me, uh, finding underscore finance. Um, and I've got a website, finding-value.com, that you can uh, join our community if you'd like. Fantastic. Well, uh, guys, if you enjoyed this content, be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video, comment down below. Who do you agree with more? The North Star boys or the engineers when it comes to uh, the uranium trade? Are you holding or are you, uh, you know, uh, selling out and potentially waiting for a better time to get back into uranium? Let me know in the comments below. I'll try to respond to every single one, every single comment. And uh, yeah, guys, I'll see you in the next episode. Bye, y'all.